Welcome back everyone. I hope you're well rested after that break. And as you can see, we have Mr. Alan P joining us once again. So look forward to it because he has quite an interesting topic. Over to you, Alan. Hi, well, thank you for having me again. Hope hope everyone can hear me and all mics and stuff are working. Yes, yeah, at, working. yeah, at the moment there's load shedding happening here, but we've got power for everything that's vital, which means our stream's gonna work. And you notice our AI powered plant water is also powered. So all the important things in life are powered. Okay, so, so this talk is going to be about creating mobile apps and of course, create uh, connecting to devices um, that maybe not via the cloud, not everything needs to be via the cloud. You may need um, near field devices or nearby devices to connect to. And we're gonna look at how to use Bluetooth low energy to do that. So we had talks about wearables, Think about that, those type of solutions in, in the space. Okay. Uh, right, so those that um, don't know me and maybe didn't attend my, my talk this morning, um, thank you for not attending if you don't know this, right? Um, so my name's Alan and I, I run a dev company that builds um, software on the Microsoft stack, predominantly .NET. Um, and also uh, run the Microsoft developer communities in South Africa. There's one in Joburg, Durban, and Cape Town. And also uh, uh, run the Raspberry Pi South Africa community as well, an admin of that. Um, by virtue of being part of the community for many, many years, I've been awarded seven times in a row as the Microsoft most valuable professional in two categories, which is dev developer technologies, which is everything related to all things Visual Studio and all things .NET, and then Microsoft Internet of Things, most valuable professional, which is all things, Internet uh, of Things and devices and all those those really fun things. Okay, as um, my second day job um, is also being a lecturer. I lecture at the University of the Western Cape at a, at a very very awesome project called the samsung future lab where we take uh, students from no skills to being employable with all this cool tech stuff okay let's get over to the content right so the most important question right is like what is this ble thing it's bluetooth low energy it's a wireless communication protocol um it's really short range right so it should be like 100 meters and things like that the really important part of why we would want to use uh, Bluetooth low energy is it consumes very, very little power. So, so like 10 milliwatts is its maximum power. It can be less than that as well, or it generally is less than that. So it's really, really useful for things like wearables. It's really, really useful for things that, that's that like beacons in a retail store or, um, in healthcare products, sports and fitness, your, your Fitbit and stuff is Bluetooth and things. So it has a wide range of, of uses. Now, what's the difference between BLE and Wi-Fi? So Wi-Fi is really for high power, right? So it's there to give you internet. So, so yay for that, because we, we, we can't live without internet, but that's high speeds. That's like hundred megasecond, um, but it consumes a huge amount of power. So that's why there's a Bluetooth low energy offering, which is also wireless, but it's lower power, but it's at short range as well. The speeds aren't so great. It's like less than one megasecond. The latest standards, you can push that higher, but generally that's your transfer rate. But between these devices, you don't really want to transfer that much information. Okay, so another a nice feature about it, especially in the case of beacons and things, um, it doesn't need to be paired. Like in Wi-Fi, you need maybe a, a username and password to an access points and stuff. Uh, in certain use cases, you don't need that in Bluetooth low energy as well. Okay, so the basic uh, workflow that that's happens in, in uh, Bluetooth is you scan, you basically scan for a device. For that device to be found, it needs to be advertising itself. So, so what's, what you have is a Bluetooth device advertising. Um, once, once you've scanned for a device that's been advertised, you can then connect to the device. Once the connection's been made, um, it will expose what's known as services and characteristics. And you can then get data flow either to the characteristic or from the uh, characteristic. And then, of course, the other important thing is you always want to disconnect once you've connected. Right, so 
So let's have a look at how Bluetooth works at a very high level. So we've got a Bluetooth device and that Bluetooth device has many services, right? So services is a grouping of functionality. Um, a device could have one service, it could have two services, could have three or however many you want. And then related to a, a service is a grouping of characteristics. So, so you can look at a service as a grouping of functionality, and then that functionality is subdivided into things called a characteristic. And then there's, there's also a piece of data that's known as a descriptor, because Bluetooth low energy is also self-describing. So it'll describe what that characteristic is. When you query the device, it'll give you the list of, uh, give you the list of services. Within the service, you can query the characteristic, and then the characteristic will self-describe via descriptor. Right, so let's have a look at what a, a, a BLE characteristic is. It's actually a piece of information, right? So, so it's there to represent data and a, and a data endpoint where you can connect to. Um, it's each characteristic has a unique ID. So it's usually like a huge, um, like GUID type type um, value. It's it's or similar to a GUID, and it's a, it's known as a UUI a UUID or Universal uh, Unique Identifier. So these these characteristics can be read only. They can be write only. They can be read write. They can also be set to notify as well, which is then pushing the information to you as well it's a, on a notification basis if the information is ready. Um, it then also has data um, that you can read. So you could read the temperature or something like that. You could set the fan speed on a device or whatever the device is, or it could be an action that could be performed. It could be like open your garage door or open your gate or something like that. So it could be an action as well. And then it represents a value. So value is the data coming out or the data going in. And then the descriptor is the description of what that characteristic is like battery level or something like that. Okay, so services are basically a collection of related characteristics. So you'll group similar functionality together and put that under a service. And that sub functionality is characteristics. It could also be the feature of the device. Um, you discover, you can have a look on the device with, a, with what's known as a service discovery request. Here's an example of a, the standard, Bluetooth also has standard um, services that's reserved for, for things to be compatible with all devices, like something a device would always have, right, is battery levels and battery, uh, uh, battery uh, would have the battery percentage levels and things like that. So all Bluetooth devices have a battery service. And in this case, we've got a battery service with a battery level um, uh, characteristic and that ba has a property of being able to read so we're speaking about read writes and things like that and it also has a notify which is when the battery level changes it can it can broadcast out to whoever's attached to it um, the battery level and then the important thing is once we look inside that uh, we have the descriptor which is the uh, describing what it is, and we also have the very important information, the actual battery level. In this case, all good, right? It's 100%. Um, there was awesome talk earlier about heart rate monitors. So, so what also is part of the Bluetooth standard is a standard way of speaking to Bluetooth-enabled heart rate monitors as well. So there's a standard service there, and the characteristics are heart rate measurements, body sensor location, and heart rate control points and things like that. So um, there was also talk about it uh, would be good to have people getting into the space. If you get into the space, you can then write a MAUI app, not biased at all, and you can use these standard um, Bluetooth services and things like that um, to, to get to heart rate monitors. Okay, so I mentioned MAUI. So Ma what, what MAUI is, this talk is, is a marriage between Ma .NET MAUI and Bluetooth. So MAUI is a cross-platform um, framework that allows you to build C Sharp and .NET applications that runs on devices that's not Windows, right? Although it does run on Windows too. So it's a unified platform. It gives you a shared UI across all platforms. That's in a, a, a markup language called XAML. And in a nutshell, it allows you to get reach and build applications for Android. It allows you to build applications for iOS, Mac Catalyst, WinUI. If you've got Samsung Tizen TVs, you can build for that as well. You can also build uh, Linux applications and things like that as well. So, so it's a 
very cool platform for building cross-platform mobile apps and getting reach across many, many platforms. The way it works is you have some sort of shared code, C Sharp, um, that you can build. It can be um, also unified communication to things like accelerometers on a device or GPSs. Weirdly, you would think that there's a there's a um, unified pattern on all these devices where GPS would work. It's not. It works differently on iOS to Android to Windows and things like that. But what's what Maui has also done is unified APIs to make those type of things easy as well. But if you do want to go write code that that uses Android specific things, you can. If you want to write things that's iOS specific things, you can as well. It gives you that flexibility as well. But the important thing is you can focus on your C Sharp and your .NET and you can work on all platforms. So part of the this, uh, this talk is Bluetooth low energy. So it also has facilities for you to run um, shared code on all platforms. So, so .NET has got a package manager called NuGet and there's nice components on NuGet that makes this Bluetooth low energy, low energy easy. So this is the Bluetooth low energy plugin. All you do is you, you um, download the plugin from, um, from NuGet and put it in your project and off you go. This also works for pre-Maui was a, was a mobile um, application framework called Xamarin. It will work for both. Okay. Important thing as well on all these mobile devices, there needs to be some sort of permissions. So, so you need to opt into these uh, Bluetooth low energy when you build your, your native application. Um, iOS has this wonderful thing called a uh, info.p list. Um, there you'll have to specify that you need to get to Bluetooth and things on the device. Um, and then of course, iOS 13 and above, you need to also um, add your your connectivity and your always usage messages and stuff like that for iOS. Then of course, Android's got the same same uh, security uh, requirements as well. In the manifest within an Android app, you got to specify that you're going to be using Bluetooth and you need to use Bluetooth admin as well. And you need to use this Bluetooth Alley for um, low energy as well. Um, so that's pre Android 12. And of course, um, Android 12 plus you need these Bluetooth scan permissions, connect and advertise for the for the runtime permissions. Okay, so I always like to use toys to to <laughs> describe um, sometimes complicated things. In this case, not so complicated. So I've got this here, this MIP from Wowie. It's a little robot that drives around and things like that. So what they've got is basically the ability to receive data and their service is called OXFFEO. And then it's got a characteristic in it for receiving data. And what they've got is a send um, service. And they've got this, this uh, um, FFE5 send service. So that's the unique IDs for each of these. And each of those have got a characteristic. So the way that this toy works is basically a publish subscribe mechanism. You send it some information via the send characteristic. And then you read information via the um, receive data ca characteristic and it notifies as well. So it's like a, like a very fancy, like publish subscribe architecture in a little toy. Right. So I mentioned that that applications need to scan. So of course you scan to find that device in this case, this little MIP. And what you can do is in code, basically set up what you want to filter, right? Because when you want to scan for devices, you might not want to see everyone's heart rate monitors and everyone's gate motors and things like that. So what you can do is scan, but then filter out for specific things. And you can maybe look at like maybe the, the, the device codes or the Mac, Mac addresses or things like that to filter out the devices that your application sees. But this is the first step. You scan for a device. And then in this case, if we had to send information to the device, um, in this example, we want to set the, the, the chest has got a little LED on it. We can set its color, right? And so from the, it's got some documentation and basically says, well, we, if we send to that right characteristic and we send it three bytes, we can specify red, green, and blue, right? So in C sharp, the code would look like this. We would ask to get to the send service via its ID, its unique ID. We would get the services 
characteristic. Remember that hierarchy that I showed? The service has many characteristics. In this case, we're getting the send characteristic. And then it's literally the case of we're going to write to that send characteristic some data. So in this case, we've got red, green, and blue. And it's basically four bytes of data that's going through. It's just a simple C sharp um, uh, byte array. We're setting the 84 is the command that this little uh, little MIP toy has to say, well, you want to set the, the chest color. And then the next three bytes is just the intensity of the red, the green, and the blue. Okay, so, so let's have a look. Um, seeing that this load shedding, I haven't got a very fancy camera set up and stuff to, and, and also online is difficult when we drive this little thing around. So, so this, is, this is how it works, right? So we've got this little UI that we've built. Um, Maui also supports owner drawn things. So we've got a custom little joystick control here and we've got some buttons and things to press. So the way Maui works, we've got this markup language in XAML. So it's XML based markup. Here we've got an image. An image has a gesture recognizer. The gesture recognizes a gesture could be like swipe, it could be tap. In this case, we want to tap an image that represents a button. And what we have here is a command that's getting executed. This little architecture we've got here is a basically a MVVM. So it's got a view model attached to this view and this chess command gets triggered in the view model. And we're sending it a parameter. So in this case, we've tapped on the blue square button and that should trigger some code. So this is the code for the command that's being triggered as well. So, so here we're saying, well, the parameter comes in and if it's red, we set the chess color to red maximum of 255 so solid red or green or blue so in that way we can then get our little robot as we press on these buttons to receive the command and then change to the correct colors and things like that it's quite cute isn't it okay right so so now if we use our joystick our custom control joystick that we've got if we move it to different positions we can drive him around so the way that works is we've got a, in our example, we've got a joystick control. And the important part of the joystick control is here, when it's the joystick control updates, it's going to send, it's basically a C-sharp event that happens. That event will be triggered. And what we will do is we've got this little function that's called continuous drive on our, on our MIP, our little MIP interface. And what happens there is all we do there is we send um, continuous drive command, I think it's something like like a hundred or something, and then it needs a speed and a turn. So so when you move your joystick around, you can turn around, or you can go forward and backwards and things. And in that case, we work out the magnitude of the joystick from the center point to where it is on the wherever on the peripheral. So some little maths gets involved, and we can basically turn it, or we can go forward and things like that. And the most important part here is, again, we're sending some data to the send characteristic and magic happens and this little robot moves around. Okay. Right. So that's just a brief overview of Bluetooth itself. But now if we look at this .NET platform is now unified for everything, right? So we've got this mobile device that's, that's working. We could have cloud apps if we want to and things like that. But the important thing that I want to have a look at now is little IoT devices and embedded devices, right? So .NET can run literally anywhere now. And then this is this is probably the coolest thing that's, that I've seen in .NET for years is something called the .NET Nano Framework, which allows you to run on really constrained IoT devices. So like those that little heart rate monitor type, type size devices as well, it can run on a 64K a RAM device, which is quite incredible if you think uh, uh, about .NET, that you can run on memory that was used on a computer like, that was created in the 1980s. Um, and if you think about it, if you just make a HTTP request to a website, your HTTP header is probably more than 64K, and that's the, and that's the memory that the, this, this framework runs in as well. So what they've done, they've basically got the ability to use um, run on devices like ESP32s, SDM32s, and things like that. Um, there's NXP boards. So all the real IoT devices. So, so like things like Raspberry Pis, yes, it's like IoT, it's a computer. But these are really the constrained devices is like where IoT really happens. Right, so, so what I've got here is another little demo. Um, this is a, 
actually what's running in my pool at the moment as well. Um, we've got space and seeing I haven't got an active camera, I'll, I'll try and move this thing into the camera view as well. Um, I've got this little device plugged in at the moment. It's got a little temperature probe here that floats in the water. So that's a waterproof temperature monitor that we've got. The device here is an ESP32. It's not the one I've got in the pool. I've got a shrunken, a, a, a smaller C3 version of this, but this is like the little prototype that we're going to use here in the demo. Okay. Right, so, so let's go to Visual Studio. Here we've got, and I hope hope the zoom, oh wait, the zoom doesn't work. Okay, cool. Right, so so what we've got here is two, two projects. We've got our Maui project, which is the Pool Sense project, and we've got another project here, which is Pool Sensor. This is the IoT device. So I'm going to open this, program.cs, this is known as Nano Framework Project. It looks like a normal .NET project, like a console app type thing that has static void mode and it's where it starts. But now, like we were connecting to the toy, we have now the ability to say, well, let's create our own device with our own services and our own um, characteristics. So yeah, I've come up with a service. That's that ID. That's I, I generated that ID. And it's got a read temperature characteristic, All right? So what we also have is this little, this little temperature sensor that I've got here is basically a serial uh, communication to the to the device. So we've plugged it into pin 16 and 17 on the device, and it's basically going to be a serial communication. It's a, it's called a one wire protocol. Okay. So the important parts here of this code is we've got our service. Um, we've got our characteristic. So remember, services have characteristics. And what we can now do is we can write some code. Okay, the other important thing is our device needs to advertise. Remember, we need to advertise to get a device to, to uh, scan for it and connect to it. So we're advertising it as a pool sense, our pool sense device. And this is where it becomes really awesome, right? So now we can say, well, like on an event, when the phone connects to me, um, I can, it's a read request, and then what will happen is I'll respond with a value, and then I'll get the, the value from here, which is literally just asking the electronics, reading from the one, the, the, the one sensor. It's basically saying, well, I'm going to do a quick read from the one wire host, get that serial data across, um, and set that up with this little component. So in .NET as well, in this nano framework, there's little wrap components. This little temperature probe is known as a DS18B20. And that's the that's the component. So I didn't have to write the logic behind this. It, it's just there. So that makes my life easy as well. And then what we're doing is we're using that one wire protocol. We're basically just reading the data from it. The important thing is we're going to attempt to read the temperature. And once we have the temperature, we're just going to return it back, which will then go to the code that's being triggered by the phone. Right. Okay. So then on the phone side, what we can do is we can go have a look at the code. What we can then do is we've got a, on our screen, we've got our XAML. It's a very simple UI here, but we've got um, a label that's being displayed. We've bound it to it's used data binding to a property within our model called latest temperature. And if we go to our view model, what we have is uh, our property that we've got here is the latest temperature reading. So when that value changes, we in, whenever it changes, we get a notify our screen that it's changed. And then if we go down, uh, we've got this on read temperature. Uh, let's find all references. That is just a command, right? So when we want to read the temperature, we're going to call that code, which is on read. And that on read will then basically say, well, my Pool BLE service, remember the service has got a, there's a service there. If we go to the implementation of that, 
all that's happening there is we're going to speak to our receive temperature. Now, this is on the phone side, which is going to ask the, the little pool sensor for value. It's going to say, well, get me that value. And then on the other side of the code they saw previously, it's going to say, well, uh, I've been triggered now. Go read the electronics and re return the value back. And if we run this, this, this should run on a little Samsung phone. Let me just get it up onto the screen. And you can see the very complex passcode of this, of this device. Okay, so we're just going to fire it up quickly. We're going to fire it up quickly. Okay, so what we have here, we have the device is scanning. Hope that's visible on the screen. The device is scanning. We've seen the pool sense. And we've basically done a connection to it. And you notice it's really hot here. So I think I'm going to go dive in this pool <laughs> uh, very soon. It's, it's running this on a timer. So every 10 seconds, the temperature is, will increase. I'm holding it now. So I'm 32. So, so uh, <laughs> that's my, my body temperature. Well, getting to my body temperature. Right. So that's a very quick look at this. There's lots of code and, and, and stuff and things to show you. But um, that's, that's the, 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 the complexity of it in a nutshell. I'll share this code for anybody that, that would be interested in playing around with this stuff. Right, so what I've done as well is I've taken it further because I've got this little home farm running as well. And I've got basically connected like water temperature and the clarity of water and the NTUs because it's, you can measure how murky your water is, if it's cloudy or not cloudy. You can read battery levels on it, the acidity, pH, and things like that. So there's lots of cool things, right, you can do with BLE and phones and stuff without necessarily needing to send it to the cloud. But what we can do is relay some of it to the cloud as well. Right, so so that was a whirlwind tour of BLE connecting to Maui and connect and bringing in this .NET Nano framework, which as I repeat, I'll think that's the coolest part of, of .NET at the moment, to be running on really constrained devices. And yes, getting started with all this stuff, there's links and, and content here. So, so we can share these slides as well. Right, but thank you very much for, for attending. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you once again for that presentation. That was very informative. And as far as you lot, you went through that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I know, in a lot of time. It was very compact. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but uh, hopefully right. everyone's going to be building like like devices with maybe heart rate monitoring. So from the previous session, mm -hmm. uh, we can build a Maui app. <laughs> yeah, now we have a, a possible future devs with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll give some time for questions to come through. Meanwhile, I had one question of my own. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, uh, how can developers ensure the security and reliability of their BLE uh, enabled mobile applications and what best practices could they follow? Yeah, so so as I was saying, it does support like unpaired bonding, right? So, so you can just connect to devices and things like that. Um, you do that if it's not important, right? So so that, that device, um, like my pool sensor, right? I don't, I don't really care if the world knows my, my pool is 25 degrees, right? So there I wouldn't have like a, like a bonding mechanism just because of ease of use, right? So I can just connect to it. I can get the information and things like that. But now if you've got like, for example, like your gate motor, right? Um, that you don't want to just pair to and then open, right? Because that has implications from a security perspective and things like that. There you would have basically pairing with either and and that does support these type of things with username password you can also have like certificates involved and things like that um it also does support encryptions as well so so if you if you're scared that people are going to listen in um like these toys and stuff we don't care but it, but things like your gate motors um and other critical information yes you can run encryption and and things like that on it and make sure that it's a, a pair with basically you can have a two-way pair right so, so the device also has to confirm that that device can pair to it and that's also supported by bluetooth All right. thank you for the answer yeah but but you start off with ease of use right yeah, and then use. you go into the security the more like, complex. Like, cool, i don't care <laughs> yeah i gotta first get used to it before 
Yes, yeah, and, and it's, it's, if it's not sensitive data, who cares? Yeah, as you said, it's just toys or like sensor information of the temperature of the pool. Yes. No one will really care about that. Yeah, I, I'd actually be, I would love it if people like connect to my Bluetooth device but with the farm and see the, the life of my plants. That would be cool. But, <laughs> but yes. yeah, it's not, it's not critical. Uh, right. Let's see. Another question I have from my side is, are there any specific design patterns or architectural considerations that developers should keep in mind when creating BLE enabled mobile experiences using .NET, MAUI, and the yeah. Nano framework? Yeah, it's it's not. It doesn't. You, you'll find most of the communications right between these devices is not like a whole like enterprise architecture, right? It's going to be a couple of services, a couple of characteristics, and that doesn't need to have that that much architecture behind it, right? From a BLE perspective, um, that toy has got an interesting publish subscribe architecture um, with with messages, right? So you send messages, and then when they asynchronously come back, that's a way of doing things as well from a BLE perspective. But then on the Maui side, you've got a choice, right? From a mobile architecture perspective, how you're going to design your application, right? So, so you've got the option to put code in the screens. I wouldn't suggest that, right? So that's why you've got um, architectural patterns to put into a Maui environment, which could be MVVM, which is model view, view model. Um, or you can use, it now supports multiple architectures as well. So, so you could go MVU as well, um, model view update. Um, so there's patterns like that that gives you a separation of screen to to um, to um, your your actual business logic and whatever logic that you need to do, right? So so you have a view and a view model potentially, and then that speaks to services. That separation I would do. That's got nothing to do with Bluetooth, though, right? So that's just to do with your. Um, and then you also have a choice, right? Do you want to relay some of that stuff to the cloud? That's a choice that you make as well. And then what I would suggest then is from that point, if you're sending it to the cloud, maybe use like a some sort of um, message queuing patterns and things like that. And these IoT platforms like Azure IoT has support for message queuing. And of course, the co common protocols like um, AMQP and MQTT and all those type of things for telemetry as well. They're also secure before there's a security question again. <laughs> there's TLS 1.2 on those and things like that. But from a Bluetooth perspective, it generally doesn't need a massive architecture. But I would, would definitely, from a Maui perspective, keep code out of your screens. Like, oh, it's, like, yes. it's yeah. like a, like a, that's a Safety. principle on yes. any platform. Yeah, right? you don't want it to be yeah. accessible to anyone. Yeah, not, yeah, nothing to do with Maui specifically. Just don't put code in screens. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. so I hope that answers the question in a very long way. No worries, I understood most of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Alan. It was wonderful having you here for our no. session. Um, no. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Okay, no, cool. Thank you very much and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. You as well. Cool. Coming up Bye. next, we have Ms. Charmaine Espiver. Hi. Hi, How everyone. Are you? How are you? Fine, thanks, and yourself? Extremely hot. It's like 100 degrees in Johannesburg. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, Johannesburg is quite bad. I have my fan on at the moment. All right. Well, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. Perfection. Now, today we really have had quite a technical, quite a technical day, and I found myself being like, "Oh my goodness, I don't know what they're talking about. Am I in the right? Am I in the right place?" So, for everyone who's joined here today, I'm here to speak on nurturing success, the power of mentorship, and socially charged career development. But before we get into that, who am I? My name is Charmaine Shaz Dube. I'm a technical professional. I work as a senior business analyst. I do run two small businesses um, and recently started teaching digital skills to impact spaces for organizations like Nelson Mandela and an African organization called TWA as well. 
I'm a conversationalist, so I do have conversations that sort of impact the African youth around Africa for our social issues. And I'm also a voiceover artist. So if you do hear familiarity in my voice, it's because maybe you've heard uh, some radio ads or if you've bought a bed, a dial a bed, you've probably heard my voice as well. So my journey sort of in the entrepreneurial and tech space is quite long. I do want to sort of correct the title that I saw at the beginning. I did work for Liberty up until recently. I'm currently in a career transition, I'm working on all these other aspects of my life. So I just do want to correct that. And let's get into it, shall we? So my history with the, within the tech space is when I was eight years old, my mother came home, this was about 1999. She came home with a computer that looks quite like that. And that was pretty much the um, smile on my face or the curiosity on my face. And the banks were getting rid of all these old computers because it was the big Y2K. And there was this whole theory that everything was gonna blow up. And they were moving on to 2000s and sort of the newer desktop systems. Onward, to my journey um, in IT, I then, my mom started actually, by the time I was 13 years old, she started fishing out my services to the neighbors. And she'd be like, no, she can fix your printer. Uh, she knows everything. She's on this computer every day. And I thought to myself, goodness, I'm not an IT technician. I'm just on MySpace all day with dial-up internet. But, you know, time went on and I eventually started studying at DUT. And within my first year, I realized, oh my goodness, IT is not what I thought it was. I literally thought I was going to be fixing printers and connecting LAN networks and that type of thing. And, and I encountered my good friend, DS, uh, Development Software. And I remember just barely making DP. And I was saying to my friend, Busi, I said, Busi, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can continue with this course. It's not what I thought. My whole life of thinking what IT was had been shattered. And I said to her, I'm going to quit. I'm going to ML Sultan. I'm going to register for PR or HR or something simple. And my friend Busi was like, absolutely not. You're not doing that. The fact that you made DP means you can do this. If we have to study all night, then let's go. Let's go for it. Surely enough, the years passed by and I passed. I made it. And I got my first um, internship back in 2014 with one of South Africa's major insurers. And I was elated. I was excited. I've, I'm now going to make some money, right? Because that's what we think when we enter the tech space. And I remember being humbled very, very quickly. Um, I had my intern manager. Uh, there was a form that you would fill in. So to kind of decide how you would appear on the system. And I was like, no, man, my nickname is Shares. I want to appear as Shares. And so whenever I sent an email, it would be Shares Dube. That lasted about a week. And my intern manager, she called me and she's like, what is this Shares Dube that I'm seeing? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, please change it back to Charmaine. It's unprofessional. And that day, I think she killed a spirit in me. And I was very, very saddened by that. Right. We're going to put that story on pause because we come back to it. Speaking on what I want to talk about today is the different mentorship types that are offered in these corporate spaces. So we have sponsoring, which is typically someone who advocates for you in different rooms and spaces. Uh, if you wanted to get a promotion or something like that, obviously there'd be a program in place before that happens. You then have coaching as well. Coaching is more one-on-one -on -one almost more supervisory, um, just checking on your daily activities and your daily tasks and helping you through sort of those situations. Then you also have learnerships, which are programs that help you sort of attain a qualification. So with learnerships, maybe you need to do six months of a certain experience-based program before you qualify as ABCD. Sometimes these are also used in places of internships as well. And really the benefits of these are great because you get the benefit of a mentor, someone who's maturer than you, has been in that space before you, they have learned mistakes and so they can help you progress your career quite quickly. You're then also held physically accountable for your success. You know, you write goals down, you meet with them every month. So you're kind of pressured to keep your career going. But ultimately for me, programs like these are great, but Ultimately, they come to an end, right? It's either for six months or a year, especially if it's done within your corporate space or within the working environment. These programs come to an end and then a new cohort would come in. And, 
you know, sometimes it's not enough time for you to develop. You know, what happens to you if you didn't get chosen for a program? We know these programs have very few people coming in each and every day. What happens if you don't work for a large organization? I was fortunate that I did work for large organizations, but even the one where I did work, it was a startup. So as much as we were part of this huge JSC listed company, I was on board in a startup and none of these structures were in place. So how was I going to grow and move on in a place that didn't have programs? And even if there was a program, you know, what happens if you don't get chosen? How do I then get a coach, get a sponsor, get a mentor, people to advocate for me? And so I want us to watch this video quite quickly. Sorry, just move on. I want us to watch this video and you'll tell me what you see. This is one of your products, isn't it? Yes, it is. Can you describe what's on the table in front of you? I think it's fantastic. It's fun, it's unique, it's beautiful. So this is a unique product? That's correct. Here's one of your competitors. Here's another one of your competitors. Now to me, that just looks exactly the same. I, so to me, they don't look the same. They're identical. It's hand-packed. That won't make any difference to the consumer. Uh, I think the bow on the top adds to the value of it. Business plan. All right, so that was quite an interesting video, right? We see this case where a business owner is standing in front of a, a shark who probably wants to invest, and he's asking her, you know, here's your product that you say you've made, and she's speaking very highly of this product. And he's asking her, well, what sets you apart? I've went to the store and found three other products that look exactly the same. What are you bringing to the table? What's different? And so, sorry, that's the thought process that I want to invoke in you today. We have so many youth entering the job markets, particularly in the tech space. And if we've all got the same degrees and the same qualifications, what sets you apart from someone else? Why should I buy what you're selling? And if we look at the example of, you know, supermarkets, we have, you know, our Woolies and Checkers and the different supermarkets that exist, you know, what sets them apart? And the criteria for what we choose is different based on the company, based on the managers, based on the program. For, in order for you to get this promotion, you must meet quota A, B, C, D. If we're using the supermarket example, I would say, you know, some people will choose a, a supermarket based on price. So we'll say, you know, whatever's the cheapest, that's where I'll buy. Some people will say, no, I don't care about the money. Um, I'll go for quality instead. And so they'll go to the higher sort of ranging grocery stores. So I would, what I want to show you today is sort of techniques that help me propel in my career where I didn't have a mentorship program, where I didn't have, um, I wasn't chosen for very many things. I was an intern trying to make my name in a startup, a startup that I didn't even know was going to make it. And at the same time, competing with, you know, 10 other interns. And at the end of this internship, it's either you, it ends or, you know, you progress because you've named, made a name for yourself through the work you've done. So how to be seen, felt, heard, and most importantly, remembered. And this is something that's worked incredibly for me, especially now that I've transitioned sort of out of a more corporate space and into an entrepreneurial space. Being remembered is something that's going to carry you throughout any industry, any career that you're in at the, at the moment in time. And I really want to talk about sort of starting with your sense of self. And there's a study called Personal Mastery. This is a course that I did um, with Gibbs. And it changed my entire life. And if, if any one of you has access to it or can Google it, I recommend that anyone looking to propel their career really do this course. Personal mastery is, is the discipline of continually clarifying and deepening your personal vision. So it's defining where you want to go, seeing the end in mind and sort of identifying what change do I need to make within me to get to where I want to go. And it's divided into several pillars. These are just a few that I picked out personal purpose. So what's driving me? Where do I want to go? What is the end? Do I want to be a CEO? Do I want to be a, a Dr. Mjali? Do, where do I see myself going? And this, this type of work takes a lot of self-introspection and self-awareness, right? Self-awareness basically says to you, are you aware of, 
of your own triggers because we're all working in workspaces and we're working with people ultimately people who have traumas people who have baggage people who come with all sorts of you know interpersonal issues so are you as yourself self-aware of what your triggers are because these can affect you in the workspace how people talk to you how you talk to people are you aware of your own biases for example and things that can affect you in the workplace because in order for you to propel you really need to know and be you know so self-aware within yourself right and once you start to build these building blocks about yourself you then use that to transform and no one's saying you have to be perfect you start to use that space to transform who you are in order to fulfill the ideology of who you want to be right and then last but not least your personal values so your value system i always say to people if you don't stand for something you'll fall for anything and so your value system then becomes your core identity and everything else will revolve around your value system i've used an example here i don't know if some of you maybe the newer generation won't know but this is the karate kid such a brilliant movie which i recommend anyone to watch and this young gentleman he moves to a new town and he gets bullied by these boys and he meets this you know sensei master who does karate and he's almost eager to get revenge and he's almost consumed by him wanting to get revenge and mr miyagi humbles him and he says no not yet you have to do the work within yourself why do you want revenge why do you feel this way why are you so angry um, so the bullies then became a representation and the movie in itself is more about self-development than you know karate karate chops Let's move into some actionable steps. So the first one for me would definitely be, you know, once you've done your personal mastery and you, you're working on yourself and in no ways does personal mastery end. That's a course I did in 2017. And to this day, I'm still learning about myself. But within the IT space in particular, you have to continuously learn. And we've seen from our esteemed speakers today that they are incredibly knowledgeable in, in their fields and in their spaces. And if you're ever hoping to set yourself apart, you have to almost break yourself apart and start to specialize in things, right? In the beginning, you come out with your diploma, your BTEC, but as time goes on and as the competition gets tough and as technology changes, we have AI changes coming in, we have changes in different fields, the medical field, the you know robotic space. You have to start to, you know, so who you're going to be in this space and you can't really do that from a social perspective if your books and balances aren't in order so always make sure that you're continuously learning and you know the perks of that i always say is the more you learn the more you earn <laughs> all right the second step which is one of my absolute favorites if i could do an entire talk on alter ego i would but i had to keep this kind of short create an alter ego Right. So this beautiful woman in the photo is Beyonce Knowles. And if you don't know her, I don't know what rock you've been living under. And to your left, you know, she's a mother with a child like everybody else. You can see in her parents. If you didn't know her, you wouldn't uh, tell her apart. And if you look to sort of your right hand side, you've got Sasha Fierce. And this is the woman who we see on stage, who's one of the greatest performers in the world. And she's almost transformed. She's completely different to, to the woman on the, on the left-hand side. So the alter ego is your second eye. It's your second personality. And this is something I created very early. And this goes back to the story of Shares, when Shares was humbled and told that she can't uh, use that name in, in the workspace. But I quickly realized that my authenticity is what's going to set me apart from these interns so you know some of the pillars that are great is one deciding what you want to achieve so again do you want to be for example beyonce one of the greatest performers on earth do you want to win 10 grammys what is the ultimate goal because we're going to work backwards from that space right then you start to develop your alter ego's personality so what are the things that makes a great performer? Okay, I have to sing and do vocal coaching every day. I have to dance and practice every day because these are the things that are going to build, right? I have to build a sense of discipline within me. So define your alter ego's personality. Create a distinct image. So again, if we refer back to the pictures, the picture on the left, we can already see that this is someone who looks like the greatest performer on earth. And if you want to be CEO one day, and if you want to be, you know, whoever you want to be, show up as that person now, start in the beginning. And I remember when I started to transition back in 2017, 
through my personal mastery, I changed my wardrobe. And I purposefully wore this pink blazer today because I want you to remember me as the girl with the shiny pink blazer. So I started dressing differently from my interns, um, from the other interns rather. And you know, we all know in the tech spaces, people rock up in jeans. I've seen people at work rock up with pajamas or what looks like pajamas. And I thought to myself, no, this is not going to be me. I'm going to show up as the boss that I think I am. And so I started, you know, wearing beautiful clothes and showing up and I have a large collection of sunglasses. And for every outfit, people knew me as the girl, you know, who came in with sunglasses. So now you're starting to create a buzz around yourself. Choosing a name. Mine is Shaz. I've had Shaz since I was in high school. And I go by that for all my friends and even some of my work colleagues as well. So choose a name for yourself, even if it's not publicly distributed. But you know that you want to activate this person when you get into certain spaces, right? Adopting a mantra. So something that you'll tell yourself to always get yourself out of um, places or return yourself back to where you need to be. My mantra is maintain fabulosity at all times. So obviously fabulosity can be, you know, an appearance, always take pride in how I feel and how I look, but also fabulosity speaks to if I'm in a negative space, I remind myself that I have to maintain, you know, my queendom. Uh, irrespective of what's crumbling around me. So adopt a mantra for yourself so that you can always, you know, use that as your call to action and get you out there. And ultimately start acting like your alter ego. Start acting like you're the best performer on earth. And there's a way to do it in which isn't arrogant or, or cocky, but it's having that self-confidence within yourself to say, you know what, I'm going to look the part and I'm going to act the part. Okay. Next, social cues. Very, very important, especially in the workplace, right? Because if you're coming into an industry or coming into a new job or transitioning, people don't know you. And so the communications that we send out, whether verbal or nonverbal, can have an effect on our interactions with people. And this I learned very early because, unfortunately, I have a very telling face. So even if I never spoke out loud, my face would always kind of betray me and give away <laughs> my cues. And because people don't know me, they would either be offended by it or be confused by it. And I never wanted to leave people in that space. So always be aware of your social cues. You have, you know, those verbal cues, not spoke, maybe spoken or written, but, you know, sometimes you go, <sighs> And then your, your colleague can hear your sigh, you know, just be mindful of things like that. And they can work both negatively and positively. You have your visual cues, so body language, you're crossing your arms like the girl in the picture. Uh, when your boss is talking to you, you seem offish, you seem distant, you seem like you're not receptive to receiving. Maybe you got a side eye, you know how you are and how you get. So try and always be mindful and, and self-aware of, of how your body is communicating with people. You know, we have auditory cues as well, aside from language, you know, things that people do that you can hear that they're upset. Tactile cues. So these are things that we feel. Things like handshake. What's up, buddy? That Those can create uh, some intimate connections, but also you need to be mindful of other cultural um, differences that maybe touching someone is against sort of their culture and maybe you've offended them. So always be mindful of your social cues within the space and within spaces around you. And one of my absolute favorites as well, along with the alter ego, is social opportunities. This is something for me that completely changed my life and put me in front of different stages across the company, right? As the company grew, we started to sort of form uh, teams for functions and I was part of something called the social committee where we organized um, events for staff so the 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 mandate of the social committee was to sort of give uh, enhance employee morale right because we're in the tech space we're on call 24 7 we're on standby sometimes and and the morale does get quite low over time so every month we used to have like a mixer or a game and I used to MC those games sorry and that put me in front of large groups of people. I hosted maybe five of our year in functions from 2017. That put me in front of, you know, our CEOs, our C-suites, and they came to know me as the, you know, the lady who does all our events. And as much as I was still doing my work, I was still continuous learning. I now had 
you know, people around me who knew me because of my character, because Shaz showed up, because she came up and she came out and she was attending CSI and she was attending all these great um, workshops. And so you start to develop a, re a rapport with your teammates and your C-suites and your executives. So do absolutely join those things. Don't shy away from them at all. And most importantly for me, I call them shadow mentors. These are people in the background who, you know, contribute to your growth in subtle ways and sometimes in not so subtle ways. Sometimes it's your mom who takes you to conferences um, as a child and as a varsity student and you were bored, but you created so many connections. Your mom who loaned out your services pro bono to the neighbors. Your friend, Boosie, who kept you in school when you were willing to give up. And I always use this story when I talk about her because I strongly believe that I wouldn't have been in the tech industry today had I left um, the campus to go and register something else. So these are your shadow mentors and most importantly yourself, because nothing I've said to you today matters if you don't believe in yourself, if you're not your own mentor, if you're not disciplined to get up and wake up every morning and, and studying is hard. Um, I studied consecutively maybe four years and did different certifications and different degrees, different degrees and, and it's very, very difficult. So if you are not in tune with yourself, you can't be mentored. And most importantly, never ignore someone because you think you already have connections. I'm always looking still to this day to make more connections, better connections. And I connected with people from the tea lady to the guy in IT and something that worked very well for me is, you know, I used to befriend everyone or relate to everyone and they would help me out to a point where my managers would be like, you know, Charmaine, I have a tech issue and I don't have time to log a call. I'd be like, give me your laptop. I have a friend in IT, give me this. I have a friend who can do this for you. You then, what happens in that situation is you start to connect your network because you have all these different people from all walks of life who can help you and then help other people and expand your network, right? And Rome wasn't built in a day. We all know that saying, but some people maybe not know, might not know the end. And that's that they were laying bricks every hour. In a world where we live that has instant gratification, if I'm hungry at the click of a button, I have food. If I need groceries at the click of a button, I have groceries delivered to my door. We live in an instant gratification world and that can often illusion us to thinking that our growth and success should be overnight. Everything that I've built to date, whether it's my businesses, whether it's my career, my network, has been over a decade and I haven't even scratched the surface. So it's very easy to be a illusioned that you should be building quickly or building faster uh, people my friend is already driving a mercedes benz my friend has already bought a house do not be illusioned by other people's success the best way to nurture your success is one brick at a time using this socially fueled way of development means that you'll be more it's more than a time program it's timeless because you can carry on through the rest of your life like i said i'm in a career transition and i'm using the same techniques that i use to get myself into these rooms right you reach a larger audience which means you have more advocates for you you have more people i just applied to uh, something at the one of the impact the grasha michelle trust and i used the connection that i made at the nelson mandela trust to then advocate me because i needed a reference letter so everything that you do then comes to this place where you need advocates who are advocates that you probably didn't even work with right and most importantly it builds lasting relationships based on who you are because that'll always be a constant in your life versus what you do i'm not doing what i did a year ago and i'm not doing what i did a year before then but the core of who i am has sort of transitioned throughout the phases of my life and i've maintained those relationships right and ultimately pay it forward I did something called, I used to do something called the black induction. Once I had made it through my internship for about two years, I was the only intern. I was the first black female to be casted as an intern within that space. And as shortly after they started adding more and more interns that looked like me. And I realized, you know, girls like me were shy. Girls like me were humbled. And I used to pull them aside for a coffee chat and be like, let me buy you coffee. I would hear their story and I would, you know, teach them the ways of the company. Say, this is 
this is what's possible. This is what can be done. And even those things, you know, don't ever think network building is just people above you. It could be even people coming behind you. So always try your best to pay it forward. It doesn't have to be a formal program, a simple conversation, you know, simple guidance and simple, simple mentorship is what I always suggest that works best. So ultimately learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And that's me. 45 minutes, exactly. <laughs> Hello? Yes, unfortunately, we have run out of time for questions. So we will ask no. uh, one or two in the chats. That's about all we can take for. So no let's problem. Talk. All right, so let's take out this one here. What mindset should a men mentee cultivate to maximize the benefits of a mentoring relationship? Most importantly, for me, receptiveness. I think a lot of youth tend to be closed off to receiving criticism. And I used to be one of those people. I used to take criticism very personally. So if I have to suggest anything, it's definitely get your mind right with regards to receiving criticism and learning not to take that personally. Right, and then as our last question, how can, uh, through your personal development, what are the personal barriers that you have encountered and improved to reach where you are now? And are they relatable to us guys starting from the ground up? Absolutely. So again, I was a person who started from the ground up. I came from, you know, Durban University with nothing but a, a in dip um, diploma. So absolutely, there are definitely barriers to your success. You know, you enter workplaces and sometimes you'll start to spot things, um, things like nepotism. People will, you know, hire their friends or promote their friends, uh, promote people they know and love. So those barriers definitely do exist. And that's why I wanted to do this presentation to help people charter a different path to make uh, their own advocates, because sometimes you don't get chosen. I know people who were never chosen for any program, for anything. Um, and the importance for me was to make connections that would ultimately talk about me in the rooms where I wasn't in. And so for me, I would strongly suggest, you know, adopting these and, and adopting the personal mastery discipline. I'm pretty sure there's some YouTube videos if you can't afford the courses on that. If you are healed within yourself, I don't think that there's anything that can limit you from, you know, getting to your best space. Well, I'm pretty sure a lot of people have learned a lot from you today. It's wonderful. You're a great conversationist. I can definitely see that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, everyone. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Dube. It was wonderful having you here. All right. Please welcome our next speaker, Mr. Somalizi Diko. Uh, Somalizi, can you hear me? Hey. Uh, your screen's currently black. We're experiencing, seems like Mr. Deco is currently experiencing technical difficulties. So we'll just give him a second to sort that out. For this spotlight of his session, he will be building on workflows that empower startups to optimize their data management and fostering a competitive edge in their respective in industries by harnessing the powers of AI, build the models with Power Automate. Join Somanese as he's on this transformative journey to enhance business efficiency and unlock the true potential of AI within the Power Platform. Mr. Digo, are you currently with us? Uh, 
right in this this in this engaging talk dis discover how startups can leverage the formidable power of ai with the power platform to revolutionize their business processes by utilizing ai in power platform startups can seamlessly extract valuable insights from their data sources enabling data driven decisions making the fuels for their growth while we wait for mr Tico, we will continue on to the next well just a brief overview of the next speaker our next speaker will be mr nazir juman mr nazir is uh, mr nazir's talk will be about the theory and practicality of Thank you for moving the screen, Nikhil. Yes, currently we are experiencing technical difficulties for Mr. Somini Zidiko. He will be back momentarily. As for the speaker after him, we will have Mr. Nazir Juman. He'll be... Okay. Hello, Somini Zidiko, can you hear me? Uh, I can. All right. I'm okay. just sorting out a few things. Just give me one second. It seems like my screen is giving me an issue. No problem. All right. After Mr. Tico joins us, we'll, the next speak will be Mr. Juman. And after Mr. Juman, we will have We'll have Ms. Amira Bedi Hafi joining us from Portugal. That is the lineup for today's selection. I'm back. Welcome back, Mr. Diko. Thank you. Uh, quick lesson that I learned today. Do not play your background on the platform. OK. <laughs> it seems you have broken it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the heads up. All right. Mr. Deco, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, just let me know. If... Can you see my screen? Wonderful. All right, awesome. Welcome everyone. Today, I just want to showcase how you can amplify business efficiency by harnessing AI Builder in the Power Platform. But before I actually get into that, it's going to be very difficult for me to top off all these great presentations that I've seen so far uh, during today's uh, conference. So hopefully I can do great. And towards the end of the presentation, and hopefully I can be able to hello. Who am I? My name is Somela Zatigo. I am a DUT alumni. Actually, I did my applications development diploma in 2017, finished it in 2020. Then I did my app dev uh, advanced diploma as well, and I finished it in 2022. Today, I am a cloud advocate at Microsoft for the Power Platform and AI, and I'm also an ex-Microsoft Learn student ambassador. I did that as a student to just go through the different programs and opportunities that are available for me as a student. And I think what shares shared in terms of being part of pro programs and actually showing up had actually been a great benefit for me in being part of the student ambassadors program and then transitioning into my career as a cloud advocate at Microsoft. I am based out in South Africa. I love building solutions with the Power Platform Teams, Azure, C -sharp and .NET, because obviously um, we had uh, C -sharp and .NET during our app dev uh, time. And also I like building solutions using Microsoft Graph. You can also connect with me because I like con connecting with the communities on Twitter at Dio Someleza. And also you can connect with me on LinkedIn to just see all the things that I actually share on those social media platforms around AI, around the power platform, and how you can be able to take a positive advantage of. So on LinkedIn, it's just purely my name, Somela Zadigo, and you can be able to find me there. Right. 
let's get into today's presentation. So before I actually say anything that has to do with AI Builder and that has to do with the Power Platform, we have to actually understand, because I remember Rory had mentioned something about the Azure OpenAI service in which it is actually part of what we're going to be doing with AI Builder today with Power Platform and harnessing AI Builder in the Power Platform. So a little bit of what the Azure uh, OpenAI service is, is that it doesn't necessarily stand on its own in the Azure offering. It is part of the Azure AI, which is a collection of artificial intelligence services offered by Microsoft, which are designed to make it easier for developers and organizations to add AI capabilities to their applications without the need of extensive expertise in AI. So it also includes scenario-based services like the bot service uh, or the cognitive uh, search, cognitive services, offering customizable pre-trained models for specific domain applications. So they could be applications that use vision, speech, or language, and the Azure machine learning on which is based on the whole of the Azure AI platform, which is designed for data scientists and developers wishing to build their own machine learning models from scratch using their own data and then deploy and manage them. Right, these services are integrated with the Azure platform, which provides capabilities such as scalability, security and compliance, as well as many other tools and services that can be used to build and deploy AI-enabled applications. At a higher level of, of, of abstraction, we can be able to find the Power Platform, which is a key focus for us today. We find the Power Platform suit, which has been enriched with AI Builder so that you can be able to enable local developers to easily integrate AI capabilities into their applications that they build for different scenarios. So also, Microsoft has adopted Azure AI across a wide range of its products and services such as your Office 365, Bing, and LinkedIn in order to improve their functionality performance and user experience in which you may have seen some of them in which I'll touch on a little bit later on. So what is the Azure OpenAI service and what are the different models that are in the Azure OpenAI service? So before we actually dive deep into what the Azure OpenAI service uh, offers, this slide actually gives you an overview of the main models that are available with the Azure OpenAI service and which probably Rory actually touched on earlier on. So you have GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, which is now in uh, general availability for text generation. You have chat GPT in which is the most fam famous one for conversational scenarios and you have DALI for image generation so before we actually go a bit further, you would find that some of the presentations uh, you saw today, most especially the one that Rory had, had a few pictures in those presentations. And a fun fact that Rory doesn't want you to know, but I know, and I will let you know, is that he used Dolly to generate some of those pictures in his presentations. So that's one of the use cases you can be able to use your image generation to enrich some of the presentations that you do for your work or you do for everything else. So on top of that, you can find the brand new features that let you uh, get the most of these models. So for an example, you have the possibility of adding your own enterprise data to pre-trained foundational model of your choice and embedded into the prompt without the need of fine tuning it, which means without the need of training it again, using a massive amount of data. You have plugins for the Azure OpenAI service, which are tools that help the language model to access up-to-date in information and use third party services. For an example, you can have a plugin for restaurant a booking service or a work app. So I know in DUT, there's a lot of projects that we do that actually have to do with booking so students can be able to just plug in some of the Azure OpenAI service models and they can be able to have an, an AI enriched application or project. You can also configure content filters on either the prompt or the output which helps you mitigate the risk of your models and desired responses. And then last but not least you can have provisions through allowing you to reserve and deploy model processing capacity for large production workloads. That's a mouthful, right? So what are the 
key scenarios or use cases can use the Azure OpenAI service. Those are the technicalities behind the Azure OpenAI service and the models that you have. But in a case where someone wants to actually use this, these models, what are the different use cases can they look at? Right. So for each and every kind of project that you actually build, the first thing that you should do is starting by focusing on what it is that you need or that you would like to address using AI. So in this case, what is your goal? And I know a lot in DUT, that is the key messaging when it comes to uh, projects whenever we build them. So here's a few uh, common tasks that I have that can be addressed using the generative AI, um, AI models that you see on screen. You might be a social media uh, manager and you want to generate content for some social media campaigns. So in this use case, you are in the content generation bucket where you can be able to generate some of the content, or you may be a developer working for a company wishing to convert your natural language into your SQL queries to get telemetry data. So in this case, you are dealing with code generation, which is a specific kind of content generation or you might be a CTO of a insurance company and you wish to extract information from volumes of unstructured data to automate claim handling process. Then you might need to integrate the semantic search packet into your solution. Or last but not least, you have a customer and they are a global bank and they have asked you to extract and summarize relevant information from high volume high volumes of financial reporting and analytics articles. So in this case, the AI feature that you'll be able to use in this case that addresses this need is called summarization. So you can use your AI model to summarize all of that information or data that you're actually getting out of that. Right, there's a specific kind of things that we know normally, and we know that we have different kinds of engineering. We have software engineering. There's also mechanical engineering. But have you heard about prompt engineering? Is it really engineering? Is it a skill of the future? If it is, how do you get better at it? Let's actually look at it and how you can be able to get better at prompt engineering. Because when ChatGPT came out, a lot of people were asking a lot of questions, getting a lot of information out of ChatGPT. So now you need to understand that what you do with ChatGPT is called prompt engineering. You are prompting ChatGPT to give you responses. And I know Rory actually used GitHub Copilot to actually generate some of his code for his solution during his demo. Right. So. I have an example for you to look at what prompt engineering is and how you can be able to look at it from a standpoint of view when you are building your solutions. Let's take a library for an example. I go to the library and there's a librarian where I want a specific book in mind and I have all the details. But when I get to the library, I ask the librarian to just get me a specific book, not even a specific book, but just one book. The librarian, if he doesn't ask me questions, he will just go around randomly within the library to get me that book. And then I'll be unhappy with that response from the librarian because it's not the book that I was looking for when I left home. How do I then make that better? Is that when I get to the library, I actually ask the librarian in this case, hey, can I have a book that is in the category or genre of fiction? The librarian, without asking me questions, would go to the fiction section, so that's the second picture that you see on the screen, and actually pick a book out of that. Not a specific book, but any book at random, and come back and give me the book. I'm still unhappy. I don't know what, uh, what to do. I'm, I'm mad at the librarian, but the librarian has done his job. Okay. So in this case, how do I then make that better? How do I get the most optimum response from the librarian? I go to the library again, I ask the librarian for a specific book. So in this case, it could be the book name, the, the genre of the, of the book. So it could be fiction, the author, the year it was published or the publisher. So with all of this information that the librarian would have, he would be able to go into the library, go to that specific section and actually look for a specific book called whatever the book title would be. That's then, that would be then me getting my desired output out of that or desired response. Similar with prompt engineering or similar with your AI models. Your AI models are sitting on large amounts of data that you can be able to pick anything at random and it will give you a response. 
So in this case, if you're very specific when you're using ChatGPT, for an example, and you say, I want X and Y and Z about a specific event, and then ChatGPT will give you that desired response. But in a case where you said, I just want a book about history, for an example, and then ChatGPT will just probably give you one of the history books. And you wouldn't necessarily be happy with that response because you are not getting what you're specifically looking for. So it's the same thing with GitHub Copilot with what Rory did earlier on, where if you're a programmer or a developer and you're using GitHub Copilot, if you ask, for an example, GitHub Copilot to add a variable, yes, GitHub Copilot will know the context of your code, but in this case, it will suggest any variable at the end of the day. You may not be necessarily happy about the response that you're getting from GitHub Copilot. But if you specify to GitHub Copilot and you say, add a variable to do X, Y, and Z, or add a method to return those kinds of results, then GitHub Copilot would suggest that kind of code, which, is, which may be your desired output or desired response. So that's how you can look at prompt engineering in the form of a library example. Right, how do we empower every person with AI at Microsoft? So I want you to understand that AI is no longer a niche capability for pro developers and data scientists, which, can, which we can provide through Azure. AI is an imperative and expected offering in our day-to-day -day productivity. So you can think about PowerPoint designer. When you're building your slides, PowerPoint designer would suggest a certain specific design based off of the content that you have for your PowerPoint slides. That is AI. Teams translation or transcription, you will then, in this case, get um, your transcriptions from a meeting that you had using Teams. And we have the new co-pilot capabilities in Microsoft 365. There's Microsoft 365 co-pilot nowadays, which you can be able to try out. The making experience in the Power Platform, as part of the Microsoft Cloud offering, takes the same principle. The, the of bringing AI uh, capabilities to aid every makers in our platform. So you enable everyone within the organization to use low-code, no-code tools to bring in AI for their solutions to increase productivity. But how does this fit on the Microsoft Cloud? I'm glad you asked. So because of the fully integrated Microsoft Cloud and our investment in open AI, we're able to apply generative AI and large language models that uh, Dr. Mjali actually touched on into the fabric of our product. Copilots is about making AI a companion to help you do your job better and faster. So you have AI as your real-time collaborator that generates content that sparks creativity and also completes your work for you. So we have GitHub Copilot for developer tools. We also have Power Platform Copilot for low-code, no-code tools as well. There's Microsoft 365 Copilot and Dynamics 365 Copilot, for an example. But what is the Power Platform? The Power Platform is a low-code, no-code platform that welcomes everyone. You don't know how to code, you don't know how to develop an app, you're welcome. You can use Power Platform to build solutions based off of your need. You know how to program, you know how to write um, code, you're still welcome. You can be able to bring in your programming uh, capabilities into the Power Platform to extend your capabilities for your solutions. So the Power Platform is made up of five products. You have Power Apps for app development, Power Automate for process automation, Power BI for business analytics, Power Virtual Agents for intelligent chats. It's actually called Microsoft uh, Copilot Studio now. Power Pages, which is external websites. And then all of these have co-pilot capabilities where you can turn natural language into an actual working solution or an application. Then comes AI Builder within the Power Platform. You can be able to add people's AI services and solutions to your Power Platform solutions, and you can infuse to you can infuse AI to turn your data into actions without code. So in a case where you want to process documents, you can build models or train custom models to be able to detect specific information in documents, or you want to do recent processing and you want to put in your expense tracker app instead of my the Power Platform using AI Builder 
with less AI expertise, meaning that you don't necessarily need to be a data scientist or a developer for that matter to actually use the services and models within the Power Platform and AI Builder. All of these are already built for you. We have pre-built models that you can be able to use within the Power Platform to build your solutions. Now, hopefully I still have the time. Let's actually see AI Builder in action. Before Nikel actually gets mad at me, I'm just gonna quickly switch over to where I want to make flow so that we can be able to use AI and AI Builder to actually automate a simple scenario. In a case where I'm a, I'm a company that takes in support tickets or customer feedback, I want to actually build an automation flow uh, to actually and take that and be able to respond back to the customer in a very polite manner using either AI Builder and also the Azure OpenAI service here on the Power Platform. So how do I do that? Before we do that, let's zoom in so that people can be able to see. Right, so within Power Automate, when I go to make Power to use Copilot to build this automation flow, in which is something that we're going to do. If you have no idea how to prompt Copilot to build something for you within the Power Platform, we actually have something called the Power Platform. Pro actually show me a list of prompts that are already pre-built by the Power Platform community and the Power Platform advocacy team to actually look at how you can be able to prompt Copilot and be able to build solutions using that. So because I see something in the solution and this demo, I'm just going to click on the first option, which is customer feedback automation. I'm just going to try to copy this text, which is build a workflow that gets customer feedback from Microsoft Forms and adds the feedback to SharePoint then send an email follow up to the submitter, include text in the body that thanks them for submitting the feedback. So I'm just gonna quickly copy that because that's what I want. Then I'll go back to Power Automate. I go to this little text box here, and then I just paste it in like that. And then I can be able to edit the prompt because I want the, the, the presentation to go a little bit faster. So I'm just gonna quickly edit here and remove the things that I don't want on the prompt. Like for an example, this end of text, I want to remove it and then remove start of text. And then my prompt should be good to go, which is build a workflow that gets customer feedback from, oh, there's also another add start of text there. So I wanna remove that. And then I remove end of text. And then I click on generate once I'm happy, right? Once I select generate, Copilot will then start to think and try to suggest, similar to how GitHub Copilot works, it suggests a Power Automate flow for me to actually use to do what I want to do for my specific scenario. So my trigger for my Power Automate flow is when a response is submitted, what do I want to do? So I have the actions. So for each item, I want to get the response, I, uh, response details. I want to create the item in SharePoint, store the information in SharePoint. I want to send an email afterwards. Okay, I'm happy with this. I can be able to select next. And then I would need to set up, obviously, the connections because obviously I'm using a Microsoft 365 account to be able to access all of those tools and services. So my connections are set up quickly and I can still see the suggested flow and then I can be able to click on create flow. Then. Copilot would add all of those suggested triggers and actions onto my uh, Power, Power Automate designer. And then you can be able to see all of the things that were suggested. The only thing that then I would need to do is to put valid parameters because you can see it's screaming at me and it says invalid parameters. So we'll start here. When a new response is submitted, we need to pick a form. So in this case, I will need to look for my form called customer feedback. It's a very simple form. You'll see it a bit later. And then get response details. Again, I still need to select the form, which is customer feedback. The response ID now comes from my trigger. 
So if I close this, the response ID comes from this trigger with all of the information of that new response, right? So how do I then access that information? Is that once I click on this text box and I click on that lightning icon, I can be able to access dynamic content from previous actions within Power Automate. So I click on response ID and then this action is good to go. But in my case, I don't want to create an item. I just want to send an email for each of those things. So I'm just going to remove this and delete the delete the SharePoint uh, action. And then because I want to respond to my customer in a polite manner for the support request or this customer feedback, I want to use the Azure OpenAI service for text generation within the Power Platform. So how do I do that? I can click on Add here to add an action between the email and the get response details. I click on Add an action. Then in this case, I search for AI Builder because this is where AI Builder comes into place because we have um, we have a, a model called Create Text with GPT that allows us to do text summarizations and be able to prompt it to give us the right response. So once I've selected AI Builder on the list of options, I can see all of the different kinds of uh, actions that I can be able to use with AI Builder. You can see I can be able to analyze positive or negative sentiment in a text. I can be able to classify text into categories. I can be able to detect and count objects and images. Goes back to that slide where how you can be able to infuse AI into your solutions. So in this case, I'm just gonna select create text with GPT. And then once I've selected create text with GPT, the only thing that I need to provide is a prompt. What do I want my prompt to do? I need to give details, instructions about the text I want the model to create or to generate for me so that I can be able to send back to the customer. Right, now I need to quickly look for the prompt that I have. So I'm just gonna quickly try and switch back to my notepad and then I'll go here. I'll go here, then I'll quickly grab a prompt that I prepared earlier on and just paste it in. So it says, generate a response in an apologetic tone to the text below. Be humble and create and uh, be humble and have a creative the problem to acknowledge the issue. The response, if any, should indicate that the problem will be addressed shortly. When the text below has less than a couple of words, answer briefly that you can't generate an answer, right? But then, Somaleza, where does this text come from? The text comes from the form or comes from the previous action. that I have here. Yeah, so I'm just gonna close that co-pilot there, which is a bit distracting. It comes from the previous action because I can be able to use, I'm just gonna add dynamic details. I can be able to see what is on my Microsoft form. So I have email, I have the nature of the request, I have provide more details on the issue where it has more details on the issue where the customer is actually stating the problem. That's the one that I want the model to look at and actually generate a very creative and humble response. So I'm gonna choose that and add it in between this. And then towards the end, I'm gonna say end of text, right? And then from there, that's all the information that I actually need. And then I can close this action and then I'll go to send an email. So. On send an email, I need to just specify who is the email going to, which is the two, so I can remove what's already there. And then I can click on dynamic content again. It will show me who exactly it, was go it is going to go. So on the form, I have an, an email text box that I choose. So whenever a customer puts It's their email on the form. I want to send an email. To them. And then I can put a subject and say thank you for your feedback. 
And then here I can put dear customer for an name, but I don't want the response back to the customer because I've already used AI to generate the response for me that is humble and creative. So I'm just gonna click on the icon for dynamic content. And then you can see create text with GPT has the generated text action or dynamic content. So I choose that text generated, and then I can add kind regards support. And then that's it. And then I can be able to save my flow just like that. And then I can go obviously back to the, uh, go back to the form and start to fill in some information. So the error here, it says the create text with GPT action doesn't have a content approval action after it. This is how we are able to enforce responsible AI within the Microsoft uh, products that we have, especially in the Power Platform. If the text has been generated using AI Builder, you want someone in the company to be able to review that generated text, either approve or reject it based off of whatever policy or whatever requirements that you have. But I'm not gonna do that. Uh, kindly, you can add an action here. I'm not gonna run the flow, but you can add an, an action here to actually do that. So if you click on add action, and then you search for approval, because you need to have an approved generated text using uh, the AI Builder model. And then you click on see more, and then it will show you all of the list of options that you can be able to use here to generate an approval. You can see, Third option is the one that we are very interested in, which is start and wait for an approval of text. So in this case, once you choose that, you can be able to put the title of the uh, of the approval, the suggested text. So the suggested text would be the generated text here. You put it in here, and then you will assign it to someone. So I can assign it to the name of this. I can assign it to the person within my own tenant, my own organization. So if your account is at, at dut.ac.za, you will put someone who is within that same domain. And then obviously you would add more information if you want to add, but it will then send an email to the approver with the title of the, of the approval, with the suggested text from uh, GPT. And then after that, they've clicked on approve, then it will send that email. So we're not going to do that in the interest of time, but just bear in mind that whenever you're building applications that use AI, make sure that you use AI responsibly. Make sure you have responsible AI. So I'm just going to quickly try and switch back to my, uh, to my, but that's basically how you can build a solution that uses AI within the power platform and it uses AI builder. So the AI builder uh, models that are available for you are your pre-built models. You can also create and build your own custom models. And then obviously you can be able to use the create text with GPT AI builder model, which allows you to have access to the Azure open AI service. So I have those resources for you because we spoke about Azure. If you're a student and you want to get started with Azure, you can get Azure credits with Azure for Students and you can look at um, the certifications on aka.ms student hub. And then if you want to learn more about how to use the Azure OpenAI service with a JavaScript application, you can go to the link here on the resources. I will share it with Mikhail so that he can be able to share it on the chat. And then if you want to learn more about how to build solutions in general using different kinds of Microsoft technologies, you can go to aka.ms forward slash faculty, where you will see step-by-step -step technical guides on how to build solutions that actually exposes you to the different kinds of technologies that are available. The last one before we get to questions is the Generative AI for Beginners course. If you scan the QR code here, my team and I worked on this to actually showcase how you can be able to get started with generative AI. So this covers your low code applications, even building and, and the introduction to large language models. So your LLMs, how to build search applications, how to build chat applications and image generation applications using 
Python using different kinds of uh, programming languages. So make sure you scan the QR code on the screen and go to the link to be able to see what we offer there on that course. It's self-paced, you can be able to follow through. It's on GitHub. You will see that it's a GitHub repository, but on the right-hand side of that, of that screen, you will click on a link that will take you to GitHub pages, which makes it more prettier for you to be able to follow through with the content. Other than that, are there any questions that I can be able to answer before Nikhil actually kills me for taking up time? Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Samanuzi. Unfortunately, as you know, we are over time, so we won't be able to answer any questions. But it's quite detailed and informative, and I'm sure a lot of people learned about how to use the Builder AI and Power Automate. Thank you so much, Nico. Thank you. All right, moving on to our next presenter will be Mr. Nazir Juman. Uh, Mr. Nazir, we apologize for delaying your speech for a bit, but if you can kindly share your screen so we can get started. Um, so Nazir, can you currently hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, perfectly clear. Okay, cool. So I'm trying to get the camera button to allow me to share my video. No problem. Okay, cool. So, um, share screen. Here we go. Uh, please let me know when you can see the screen. All right, we can see you currently sharing it. Um, okay, cool. So, All right, perfect. Okay, perfect, yeah. Okay, so let's go for this here. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Nazir German. I am an architect at Daryl Solutions. We are a um, software engineering provider. Um, just tell me if you can still see my screen. Is it um, on the clean code presentation? Okay, cool. So yeah, um, I'll be presenting uh, clean code and in C Sharp and .NET Core. So just a bit about myself. I've spent the last 20 years of my career in engineering, transitioning to software engineering, spent quite a bit of time in different business domains, and I've done time in brownfields and greenfields development. Um, so my job requires me to have a broad understanding of software engineering spectrum. But I would say like .NET Core and C Sharp is my preferred language. I'm, I've done and currently do work in Java and other language and frameworks. You know, I've seen good code, bad code. I've seen nightmares. So just a disclaimer on this presentation. You know, these views are mine and do not fit those of my employer, any past employees. You know, anything I present is not a reflection on the client or anything like that. Um, it, it's just purely what I've gathered over you know my career. So just to kick in. Um, so this is going to be a mixture between um, a presentation and kind of, you know, also a demo as well. So I understand we push for time, so I'll try to, you know, push things as fast as I can. So just to give an idea, you know, what is clean code? You know, um, you know, people talk about clean code. So, so what does that mean? You know, I, and I like the term that's given in Robert Martin's uh, book, Clean Code. So, you know. You know, looking at this definition, you like my code to be elegant and efficient. Logic should be straightforward. You know, it should make it hard for bugs to hide. You know, dependencies should be minimal. You know, easy to maintain. You know, error handling. It should be articulated. The code should, you know, they should. It should be able to read well. Um, and that's kind of what clean code is, you know. It, it never obscures what the designer is trying to do. You know, it, it's straightforward. It's clean, and it's to the point. So if we look at what, what are some of the attributes of, of clean code, okay? 
And it, it, it ultimately comes down to, you know, the different schools of, of thought when it comes to clean code. Um, and I would say that it comes down to how a developer glows with experience and that kind of helps them, you know, evolve in a career in clean coding. So this is made up of object orientation, design patterns, solid principles, software methodologies and practices, you know. And the one thing that go and goes without saying is that you have to practice coding and using of these principles and you have to entrench that concept and then you know it becomes second nature in your everyday development you know developers you know one thing that we always say and there's kind of an ethos amongst developers and architects and designers is that you should always aim to leave the code base cleaner than you found it you know um so looking on and you know what are some of the attributes of clean code so one of the things that i come across often and i'll, I'll demonstrate this is you know naming and for example you know uh, a variable that that is very badly named so um is my audio still coming through clearly um there's no delays on it am i just drop the mic sharing and uh, the camera sharing i think the internet is a bit choppy at the moment Okay, cool. So one thing I've, I've experienced a lot is namings and obviously variable names, you know, variable names are quite uh, important when it comes to your, your coding and your syntax. So, for example, calling, you know, a variable X or a string X, you know, it's it's not something that's meaningful to another developer. So in you know, for example, the infamous for loop, you know, i is equal to zero, i plus plus. It might seem trivial, but when another developer is looking at that at one a.m. in the morning and production goes down, you know, it, it becomes you know, it, be, it becomes glaringly difficult for them, and it's not glaringly obvious. So one thing is always make your naming convention. So if you're calling something int d. Um, and that's not meaningful, so rather call it int. And if it's meant to call the days in the month, then actually call that you know, using chemical camel case notation, call that days in, in the month. You know, make the variable all you know obvious and meaningful. You know, so anyone in you know in the future will understand the intent of the variable in the logic. Right? Um, consistency also, you know, be very consistent in, in naming your variables. Um, you know, you don't want to kind of, you know, use an underscore camel, camel casing, a Pascal casing. You know, if you're choosing a particular style of, of coding and variable naming, use that. Also, with your method names, you know, try and if you're using, uh, you know, for example, uh, an underscore prefix for your global variables, you kind of want to, you know, carry that through. Um, also, your method names do not use camel casing and then Pascal casing. You know, try not to you know mix those up, right? Um, functions. Um, so functions are kind of a, a difficult topic, and you know you might have a god function in your code that does everything. What you should aim for is you know functions that do one thing, and and do one thing only. So. Um, you know, that function doesn't introduce side effects into your code. So what do you mean by side effects, you know? Um, so, for example, I'll show you later in code that if you're changing your encryption method or your data service, you know, you don't want that to kind of then interfere with how you, you know, going to test this yet. Because if you're changing one thing, you shouldn't be able, you shouldn't, you know, want to change your entire code, you know? Um, so one other thing is a command and query separation so the, the the difficult thing about this talk is that there is so so much uh, so many topics that you have and so many aspects of clean code that you know it took me a number of years to get them right so i'm, I'm just trying to go through them and if there's further questions then i'm happy to go through them so i'm just going to run through them very very quickly um so command query separation you know if, if you issuing a command that's doing something that's going to manipulate data then you should clear that and a query should be something where you just get data from that um you want to keep things dry you know don't repeat yourself um you know make sure that you, you that you're looking at your code if there's a particular set of methods that you want to go through you you kind of want to refactor that and and keep that um consistent so 
uh, and you don't want to duplicate that logic as well. So another rule is, you know, the KISS principle. So that's basically keep it simple, stupid. You know, it's, it's small functions that are simple. That's also, you know, very, very um, explicit about what it does. Um, another one that's that's not listed on here is comments. You know, uh, when people, when you developers uh, start commenting in the code and they try to push that to actually other developers, it means that they're not really confident of the code. They they're not really um, it's it's not really expressive. So what that kind of feeds through is um, this is not clean code. So Comments should be kept to minimal. You rather want to kind of keep your methods, you know, your method names, your variable names, all of those things very, very explicit um, and very, very intentional about what it does. So um, that's something you want to do. You know, aim to be explicit rather than being implicit. Um, formatting, if you kind of having your curly braces on one line and then the next one, you know, you, you go all over the place, you know, you kind of want to keep your formatting consistent, you know, keep your, your classes, you know, neat and tidy, you know, logical groupings of expressions. So that's something you should aim for. Um, object and, and data structures, you know, one thing you need to determine, for example, if I have a person, you know, you want to discriminate between what's an abstract data structure and, and what's a concrete data structure. So an abstract data structure would be a person uh, or, um, you know, for example, you know, what you, if you're thinking in context of payment, you know, of an employee, is that person a permanent employee, a salaried employee, um, a contractor, you know, those are the type of things that you will think about discriminating in your objects and data structures. And error handling. Um, I, I see this often in code where you kind of don't return proper um, errors. You know, you don't let that bubble through. You know, you, you kind of will put a bool in there saying return true or false. It's kind of meaningless to whoever is consuming this. So you want to be very consistent. You know, rather throw meaningful exceptions and let that bubble up to in the user than actually, you know, trying to handle that. Um, Another thing that I see quite often is uh, returning nulls. You know, you don't want to return a null. If something is not meant to be null and something is not going to handle a null, then don't return that. Also, in the same token, you don't want to pass in an ultimate method. You're not going to know how it's going to react. So, you know, nulls are kind of, um, how would I say, it, 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 it's not good practice to put that into your code you rather want to use uh, nullable types you know and check for those in, in your code um boundaries so one of the another things that's, that's quite interesting with software is, is boundaries you know often you're going to use third party libraries in your code and you kind of want to make sure that you know you want to wrap that up say for example if you are using um and i'm going back to encryption here if you're using a, a third-party encryption uh, you know uh, library you kind of want to wrap that up and, and expose a proxy in there that says you know this is my i encrypt a string and I, I give it a key and it gives me back an encrypted string what that allows you to do with the proxy pattern is it allows you to abstract all you know the third party way it also is kind of an anti-corruption that doesn't bleed into your code base. So if you want to change your your encryption mechanisms later, you can do that. So jumping onto unit testing, um, you know, you cannot have um, clean code unless you have unit tests. So unit tests kind of is a, a, a I would say a metric on how easily you can test your code. If your code is clean, if your code is, you know, um, you know, it does one thing and they, you know, comprise of smaller functions and it's easy to test. You know, one of the laws of TDD is that, you know, you do not write production code until you have a failing unit test. And second law is you do not write more, you know, of a unit test that is, you know, sufficient to fail. So, you know, once it's compiling, that's it. And, you know, you don't rely, you know, write more production code, then that's what's required to pass that test. So, you know, just positive and negative tests doesn't mean that you have clean code. You know, you want to test scenarios, you want to test edge cases. Um, yeah. um, another thing is classes, you know, 
often you know you'd find there is not a clear concept between private and public variables so in that same token you want to make sure that your the private variables are kept and they cannot be manipulated you know there's a, there's a method there's a get and set for setting that so encapsulations you know you need to keep a you need to keep a function that manipulates data private you know classes should be really small they should follow the single responsibility principle they should do one thing and one thing only which, which leads me on to something that I've been saving for kind of the last on, on this presentation is that your single responsibility, of, sorry, your solid principles. So solid principles is actually an acronym for um, single responsibility principle, open, open closed, list of substitution principle, integra interface segregation principle, dependency inversion principle. So kind of what does this all mean? Uh, so if a class single responsibility means that if a class should change it should only have one reason to change and that comes to side effects meaning that you don't want to have a class change you know uh, for something else that is not responsible for so keep your classes small again this is quite an in-depth subject you know we can go on talking about this but i do understand time is limited so your open close principle um, you know, soft entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. For example, if you have a logger, if it's logging error, regardless of how you log that, you know, impl implement that logging interface, it should be kept away from the instructions. So you can always extend that, but you know, uh, it's, it's closed for modification. You know, that contract, I log an error, I pass in a string to this method, that, that's kind of set. Uh, let's go to substitution principle. This is a bit of a difficult one to explain. So a derived class must be suitable for the brace for appearing classes, and this kind of you know is breaking um, your object orientation. So basically, whenever you have poly, you know, into when you have a super class and you have a base class, you know, you don't want that to be easily substitutable. So I'll kind of skip over that. That's a bit difficult to explain. So interface segregation principles. So again, when you refactoring code and you start you know moving everything to interfaces, you kind of want to have smaller interfaces, you know, don't force someone to input or don't force a developer to you know, implement an interface that they don't need to do. Um, another one is, sorry about that, that's a dependency inversion principle. So dependency inversion principle, you should, you know, d depend upon abstractions, you know, so invert your dependency. So you don't depend upon concrete types. You want to kind of depend upon interfaces and this is kind of leading on to you know .NET Core and its built-in dependency uh, inversion co container. So previously with the .NET framework, you had to use uh, a third-party dependency injection framework like um, Ininject or nSubstitute that would provide you a dependency or an IOC you know inversion of an IOC container. So with .NET Core from the onset, they have baked in dependency inversion into their framework, and that has progressively been better. So you, this is kind of key for testing. You kind of want to depend on the interfaces. I mean, you get your testing, you kind of you can inject mocks or you know stubs for for that matter into your framework. So. Um, design patterns, again, design patterns as entire courses and design patterns, but design patterns, you know, falls into your, your categories, your, your, um, and for example, you could have a design pattern like your proxy pattern or your singleton pattern, or you could have a facade, um, you know, and that's your gang of four patterns. So what's the purpose of design patterns, you know? And it's it's there to make your code, you know, reusable, bug-free and clean. You know, it wants to speed up your development process, you know, changes and modifications become easy. And the entire goal of design patterns is to kind of, um, you you want a solution to a problem so design patterns are kind of templates or the kind of solutions to problems that you face for example if you're interfacing with a payment service you kind of want to use a proxy uh, proxy pattern so you, you you abstract it away from your code if you you know have for example data you want to use a repository pattern if you have uh, caching, you want to use a singleton pattern, for example. So those are patterns in place that help you to kind of provide 
um, you know, um, templates or, you know, for lack of a better word, patterns on how to solve a particular problem. So the next topic is coupling and co cohesion. So coupling and cohesion, I think, is kind of the most, and the reason I put this in the end is kind of bringing all of this together. Um, they are two separate terms, but coupling refers to you know the degree of interdependence between software modules. So you know how closely connected are your modules? You know in your code, how closely um, connected are your changes? If I introduce a change, how does that impact other pieces of logic? You know, so you kind of are, you know, you want to aim for low coupling, you know, smaller pieces of of work. And also with, with larger projects where you have cohesion, where you have multiple projects and libraries, that's cohesion. So to you know, to what degree do elements work together to fulfill a single thing? High cohesion may, means that you know your, your elements are close related and focus on a single uh, purpose, while you know low cohesion means that elements are loosely related and serve multiple purposes. So um, both coupling and cohesion are you know important factors you know depending on how maintainable, scalable, and reliable your software system is. So you want to you know aim for for high coupling and and low cohesion, and you know to help you make your you know your your software suit you know a bit better. So I know there's quite a bit of theory to get into, so I'm gonna jump into a bit of a demo. Um, just gonna rely on someone to help me to tell me if they can see Visual Studio popping up in front of them. Um, can everyone see the screen of uh, Visual Studio? Is it still showing the, the slideshow? Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, cool. That's good. That's coming through now. So, okay, cool. So, this might be a bit small. I'll try to increase the size of this text. But anyway, this is this is a small program that I kind of put together just to demonstrate, um, you know, what we're trying to do. So, given this whole, you know, the entire uh, um you know cyber monday and all the specials that have been going on to your different online providers um this business model is basically a payment provider that basically has crashed and they have pushed all the payments into a csv file and some poor developer now has to go and figure out how much do they owe the much uh, so how much you know do they Kind of need to pay the merchant and how much do they need to keep for themselves so this is for example will be like you know your, your pay fast or your pay gate so some developer has written this here but unfortunately you know with you know with with software concepts go into production and become part of the ecosystem so nothing is kind of in you know always in concept mode so for example if you look at this here this is I would say in my opinion it's really horrible code um, I'm just going to kind of run through it and and what it does um, if you a developer and you kind of get this code and you need to debug this at, at 1 a.m. in the morning it's going to be you're going to curse the, the person that actually wrote this code so I'm using a NuGet package in here and the NuGet package is a CSV reader so just to I know this is not going to come through clearly but um, let me see if I can push the payments file into here. No, okay, that doesn't matter. So basically, what this is is basically a CSV file with kind of names, and I'm just going to try and do this one more time. Open. Okay, cool. So this is a simple CSV file that has basically an ID. It has a first name, surname, the address, the transaction date, uh, the merchant code, the amount, and the status. So basically, what we're aiming for is we we trying to figure out what you know what percentage of the payment do we keep and what percentage goes to the actual merchant. So. Um, if you look at this code here, so basically I'm using a NuGet package that's basically going to open up the CSV file. So you can see in here, so um, it's going to read through 
the CSV files is going to insert into the database. Um, then after it's inserted into the database, it's going to go and get unprocessed payments from the database. And it's going to work out using some algorithm that you got from business to say that if the payment amount is between these bands here, then this is the the fee that we charge on those payments, and that's the you know, that's amount we we keep, and you know the the settlement amount is what we settle to the merchant. And after we're done, we kind of you know push all those uh, we we write we update the file to say that payment has been processed. We go back to the database, and I'm obviously using um, that that's not a real connection string. So basically, I'm not going to use real passwords in here. This is kind of my personal laptop. Um, and and what we do is we go back to the database, we find out all records have been processed, we get those records, we encrypt the records. So you can see in here there's encryption key in here, and we push all of those records to files. So just to highlight a few things in here, I mean this is I mean this is not clean code. This is this is horrible code, this is nightmares, and this is what kind of you know you know future developers that's gonna inherit this code are going to hate. So the first thing is everything is in one file. I mean, you should split the models up. And it's not clearly intentional as to what this is. Is it a data model or is it is a payment model? So you kind of want to get your naming correct. Um, also, you, you notice that I mentioned something that I mentioned earlier is uh, the casing of, of get name. You kind of want to make sure that that get name is correctly cased in here. Um, we overriding the true string for for purposes that you know obviously somebody was debugging and and they put this into here so that's bleeding into your code base so this, let's kind of go through this from the top um, again you kind of have a a value in here a default percentage meaning that if I cannot figure out what split I will use a default you know a percentage of of fifteen percent to kind of you know charge that to my to, to the merchant. So I'll charge in 15% of a transaction. So again, that's not configurable. Um, if you look at the naming in here, this says stuff. I mean, you cannot name something as stuff. This should be named properly. That should be payments. Um, again, your stream reader is getting looking at a particular part. So it's going to a hard-coded part that's in here. So this is going to be running on the developer's machine. Um, he's only going to test this, he or she will test this on their machine, and you know this is not good practice. You shouldn't have magic strings lying around in, in your code. Um, if you go down here, you would see that we kind of have a SQL statement. Um, again, this is not good practice. You should abstract this out. Uh, this is called iSQL. What does that mean? You know, it, it's not meaningful. You know, I should call this SQL statement to insert a payment or something meaningful. Um, I'm opening up a SQL connection in my code. I have my username, my password, my server IDs all hard coded in here, and you know that's you know it, it it's it's ruining the or it's basically the, the intention of this code is becoming muddled up. So again, I go down here. I'm repeating myself again. So I'm opening up another connection. I am going and reading from the payments table, getting all unprocessed payments. Again, this is not clear as to what this is doing. So um, developer coming in here is, you know, is this process payments, unprocessed payments? It's not really clear to the developer. Again, um, it's calling payment list. This should be payments. Um, SQL, what SQL is this? You know, it should be clearly named. The variable intent should be clearly named. Um, if I look at the record status again, this is a magic string that that's been placed in here. It's not meaningful, so it says if status is equal to paid, then process this. And if you look in here, there's a whole lot of magic magic strings in here. If business wants to change this, someone has to rewrite this, um, update this here, retest this here, make sure there's no side effects introduced, and then redeploy this code. So again, once it's done, it basically updates the payment on the table to say what's the settlement amount. Um, what's the fee that the, the actual payment provider keeps and what, what do they set to the merchant? It updates this here. Um, if you scroll down in here, then we go into the actual, once it's been processed, I want to get all payments that have that have been processed and I want to kind of write that out to the file. So now we're going into um, getting that record out. We, we're writing, we're serializing each record. 
um, we then saying we've got the encryption key hiding in our code. So if we push this code into a code base, it means whoever has access to the code base is going to be able to see this key. Um, the encryption algorithm is going to here. So if we change the encryption algorithm again, you know, we have to retest this code. So again, magic strings, incorrect naming, not clear intentions. Um, and it then writes this file out to a particular um, location. So you would see in here, you know, CSV write records and that writes all your encrypted records at a particular location. So yes, while it's encrypted, um, if I know, uh, if I have access to the code base, I can easily get this out, you know, my, my secrets not stored properly. So there's a lot wrong with this code. Um, I'm not going to make this into a question and answer um, session, but I kind of want to show you a refactored version of this here. So instead of rewriting it again, I've kind of done this all beforehand. So I'm just going to stop sharing and reshare the. So this is what my refactored code looks like. Um, you would notice from the previous, we just had one method in our console application. And what we have done now is we have moved everything over um, again into smaller classes. Um, so for example, we'll start off with the payment service. So what you'd notice is the, the D from the solid principles coming into play. Um, I'm depending on, on interfaces rather than uh, implementation. So I have I've inverted my dependencies. So um, I have I file service, data service, logging service. So out of the bat, one thing you notice is that the previous code did not have any error handling. And error handling is key in your code. You cannot expect your code always to run. So you should always have a cater for error handling. I'm not returning methods. Um, you'll see I cater for a file, not for an exception. So in case if the file just gets triggered off from you know a cron job, um, if it's running in AWS, it's get triggered from you know SQS from a Lambda or whatever it may be. This particular log logic will say if the file is not found, it, then it has a notification service notified the administrator and the file provider. Or if there's just an exception with the code, then you just you know notify the administrator. So look, let's just look at this code. And, and if you look at this here, it's it, the smaller functions. It says get payments, process, process payments, and store encrypted payments. So if you read this here, clearly you can tell off the bat that what this code does. It's, it's getting payments, it's processing them, and then it's storing them encrypted versus the old code, which had a long list of logical statements that was not correctly named. Again, my naming convention, I've chose underscore that, that fourth is throughout. I've made my classes read only. It's in, instantiated at uh, my constructor. Um, and each one of these method, these function names are correctly um, in a Pascal case. So they, the naming is consistent and the descriptive in the naming, the, the, the intent is there of what it does. So if I look at get payments, uh, get payments now relies on a file service to tell it that, okay, cool, um, give me a list of payments from the file. It doesn't tell me how I get this file. It could be FTP, it could be from an HTTP service, it could be from AWS, it could be from Azure. Um, I abstract this out. I just know it's a file service and I'm getting a list of payments from that file. So that's abstracted out from me. Um, then I loop to the payments. I segregate my data model from my um so this is actually a typo it's actually meant to be a pen okay cool so i'm just gonna take this here out from here okay cool so just to show you what payments is. So I've, I've segregated my, my model from my data model. So my data model, you know, is different from the payment model. So 
my file service will give that to me a list of payments um, if you look on process payments which is the next step in the process it, it relies on the payment data itself so I'm not dictating where this is stored I rely on abstraction that gets my data my, my payments for me um, and I get my, uh, my unprocessed payments, I process the payments. So now my field calculation service, where I actually calculate my splits, is abstracted out. So if I need to change my fee calculation service, you'll notice that um, it, it changes only in one piece. I don't have to retest my entire code. I can write a unit test for this here, and you know it will all be correct. So another thing you'll notice is i've written a configuration provider so the configuration provider there is no magic strings in my code everything of my you know all my values are stored in app settings i get that from app settings if business wants to change you know your bands from your zero to to um you know your, your payment levels they can easily do that in here as well as your payment fee i know this you know you, you can do this better this is not the optimal way of figuring out a payment mechanism but this is just for demonstration purposes you'll notice that the encryption key has been stored away my file configuration my input and output has been stored so even in my file service i'm, I'm pushing my configuration provider i've just done a not implementation exception here just to demonstrate um, my data service as well it's clearly um, it tells me that it's either create I'm getting process payments or getting unprocessed payments there's no passing of values or anything like that so even the update as well it's it's clearly in, intentional of exactly what it's doing in here um, if I hop back over to the payment service um, the last step in this in this would be your store encrypted payments so store encrypted payments again it's it's going getting the process payments then it relies on an encryption service to encrypt this year. So if I choose to change my encryption service, I can easily do that without introducing side effects into my code. Um, I know time is of the essence. Um, just to explain in here, DTOs, data transfer objects. So when I'm moving into my fee calculation service, I do not pass an entire model. I use a DTO. Um, and you'll notice everything is separation of concern. So my my logger, which is my logging service, um, if I look at that, there's a contract in there that says log debug, log info, log warning. How I implement that can be done at, at runtime. So I can choose a console logging for my testing or a fake logger. I can use nlog when I'm actually writing production, you know, pushing this to production. And my dependency in version container, so I know there was a slight issue with it here because I did some upgrading. But yeah, your dependency in, in version container would then allow you to kind of pull whatever um, dependencies and complete implementations that you require in here. Um, okay, cool. So jumping back to this presentation, I'm just going to stop sharing and share again. Uh, okay, cool. So someone has mentioned we are out of time. So I'm just going to quickly try and finish this off. Um, just out of interest in Visual Studio 2022, one of the things that you have is um, advanced IntelliSense. So basically, it's an AI-driven IntelliSense. So sorry, AI-driven IntelliSense. So it helps you to write code. So I think the previous speaker did speak about you know Copilot. You have Copilot in Visual Studio 22, that's your enterprise and professional. You can use an integration with GitHub Copilot. So you can ask GitHub, you know, Copilot, how do I write or how do I implement a proxy pattern? How do I use the repository pattern? It would help you to do that. Um, CodeMade, um, in my code, I've used CodeMade. So CodeMade is another tool that's free. Um, SonarLint is another tool that's free. SonarLint uses something called SonarCube. So SonarCube uses metrics and heuristics to kind of measure your code quality. Um, you can use ReSharper. ReSharper is an awesome tool, and it's it, but unfortunately it's a paid for license. So um, it, it 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 does real time. Um, it gives you real-time feedback on your code and it tells you kind of where your code is, you know, heading wrong. So .NET Core is multi-platform. Again, targeting, there's a lot of features in the .NET Core platform that help you to write cleaner code. Um, the syntax is kept up to date. 
with the latest version .NET Core 8, there's a key name DI store. So dependency in version, you can actually have key names in there. So you can pull particular key names out, as mentioned, the AI-driven IntelliSense. Um, yeah, um, I know I'm out of time. Uh, I think Nikhil has mentioned that. Um, I'm not too sure if there's any questions. I'm sure we're going to skip the questions, but yeah, um, kind of that's that's my very in a nutshell presentation of clean code. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was quite informative, as we saw a lot of the coding practices and how things should be structured. We do have one question, but unfortunately, as Nikita said, we are out of time. So we will, won't be able to answer that there. We'd like to thank you for joining us today, Nazir, as it was quite informative, especially to our audiences that are new to coding. This was a wonderful presentation for them. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. All right. Joining us as our final speaker today, we have Ms. Amira Bedihafi joining us from Portugal. I just pro brought to enter for you guys. Uh, you hear me, I suppose. Uh, yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for um, the invitation. And um, I'm happy to share with you this uh, session. I, I had to shorten like my presentation since I, um, you know, honestly, it's Monday and um, let's say a lot of meeting, a lot of meeting today as I didn't expect at all. Uh, <laughs> so. I want to go over. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I know. Thank you very much. So uh, let's start. I try to deliver something which is not like that technical. Uh, sometimes I know um, because I had the question. It's like, uh, uh, and I already asked the question before. Um, I understand some of us maybe chose the IT field. Some of us didn't, like in my case, it was like, um, let's say by accident. So I, I wasn't uh, honestly 100% convinced with it since I got my uh, baccalaureate. So I was very, uh, more, let's say, more into mathematics and physics. So let's say I decided not to go for um, preparatory studies. And instead, I one of my teachers, he convinced me to um, choose the IT field uh, in my university. So why business intelligence? Why this major? It's like the second chance or the maybe the second question that comes to my life, but just want to, 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 to explain that uh, I, I don't consider myself as a sex story because I believe like, uh, Everyone has its uh, story for success. Uh, we fail, we succeed, that's life. But I, I, I was never, um, let's say, uh, satisfied with the education system. So finally, uh, after years, I just found my, my way to, to learn and to share the, 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 what I've learned so far. So. My session is how free mentorship and, of course, online communities transformed my business intelligence uh, journey. So, uh, quick introduction about me, myself. <laughs> I'm a full stack business intelligence engineer. Um, my AKA is the data witch, because I I try to uh, help like different entities uh, to um, exploit the, their data and into um, insights, uh, strategies, uh, I'm also technical blog bloggers. And you can find me on, on LinkedIn. I share all my contributions, everything there. But before uh, that, let's see the journey, my journey in business intelligence. As I already told you, uh, I, like choosing the IT field wasn't my, I was not like, since I was a kid, I thought like everyone, I was going to be a doctor, but it's not the case. So, okay, I was convinced and I found myself that I can do something in IT. And then the second challenge, when I was in engineering school, I had to apply for business intelligence. 
where in advance um, I had to get to to have like specific score to got accept. Uh, so mainly with the familiarity and flexibility with databases, statistics, uh, you know, algebra, etc. So, uh, but I, I would thank all my teachers who, who who understood how to 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 deal with me because I'm I wasn't <laughs> an easy person, an easy student. I I ask question, I don't accept like answers easily, and I want to try to to to, to find the information by myself. So the first um, step in the business intelligence like journey was my former university esprit. Uh, it was like, um, as I already mentioned, I never was like, uh, if I'm going to tell it as stories, like once upon a time, let's say in the vibrant like corridors of um, esprit, there is a young student <laughs> named Demira. She discovered like, a word that would forever, let's say, um, change her path. So I was like really fascinated by, by the rapid advances of technology, uh, especially in data, data and data. I remember I was still, I still like my first um, year in junior school and that was the year where uh, Microsoft released, um, released like Power BI. So I embarked the journey filled with curiosity and let's say thirst for knowledge. Uh, let's say since 2012, uh, I was like integrating the first club I found. It was like Microsoft Cloud Club. So I I discovered the, the different technologies and it was like web development, mm, not my thing. Mobile, no. no, until I found like data because um, I was fascinated since I, I read maybe a lot of books. Also, I joined Isaac with Esprit. This was like the same period, Isaac, which is, a, which is an international like um, association to help students uh, 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 go on exchanges. So I joined Isaac as a volunteer, just uh, want to a volunteer member to 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 help Tunisian like students. In, it's international. Each country you have like uh, the member committee. So I was in, since I'm Tunisian, I was in Tunisia. I used to help like Tunisian students to participate in volunteering exchange uh, abroad. So we were like somehow obsessed with the numbers because we had prices, okay? And we have like um, I remember some KPIs to fulfill like NPS, uh, the satisfaction, everything. So, and I was uh, that, um, let's say, uh, I, I was arguing a little bit about the way we were collecting data and exploring it. So imagine each, each um, let's say, board, uh, member boards, they came, instead of having like, let's say, referential for them for data, they don't find anything. It's only Excel files or sheets, Google Sheets, like here and there, nothing centralized or decentralized. So um, I quickly like realized that I had to seize this opportunity uh, that at least Isaac offers um, online to um, for, for its members, so uh, to support local and national entities. Uh, in other countries, so I I went further. Like I started contacting um, like uh, the committees and inviting them to uh, awareness sessions about uh, like on the importance of uh, data in what we do, like transforming data into actionable strategies, into actions. And in the, the meantime. Uh, like uh, since maybe the, the the horizon of opportunities in Tunisia wasn't that uh, um, we're still like emerging, um, like the the period is like after the revolution 2020, 2012. So it was it was a little bit tricking to find an opportunity. So I had to create the opportunity. So um, in the meantime, while like still in college because I six years I know it's a little bit long between bachelor degree and, and 
engineering degree, I discovered Stack Overflow, the same like period with Isaac. So, uh, and it was important shift really in my career. So I never liked, as I or, or, always say, I never liked the education system. I was looking for uh, other ways to learn. Um, uh, so Stack Overflow was for me uh, the, the platform like um, and Serene Node for uh, let's say it's extensive community uh, uh, of programmers and IT professionals. I remember I was like fascinated by that. Like I see uh, people are just there online answering for other people um, questions without like getting paid because you know if you were in college you're just uh, with the, the culture we had like you're, you're trying to uh, just uh, finish your studies and get a job and you're obsessed with the the, the the idea that you need money to survive and here i found people that they are here to support me to revolutionize like the way knowledge is shared and they're not getting paid and especially in in special like uh, specialized fields or specific fields like business intelligence. So I was looking for this new model of learning. Let's say uh, epitomized like by the sharing is caring uh, ethos. So um, which is underscoring the 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 power of collective wisdom and collaboration in fostering. Uh, uh, um, course education and, and and professional growth the first period i was just receiving i was asking questions i just needed to know more about the, the rules of the platforms how to ask a good question how to uh to find the information etc so when i was beginner uh, uh, I, I don't deny that it served as an invaluable like resource for me for navigating at least the, the the complexities of some business intelligence tools and concepts. Okay, so I was really seeking specific advice on on on, for example, uh, some softwares like Power BI, Tableau, some languages like SQL. For the, the the main ones, at least that I called the recipe, the ingredients of the recipe uh, for, for for the business intelligence. So I was trying to tackle real uh, uh, word problems that I encounter or I encounter using, using these technologies. So then one day after feeling this belonging and mutual, I was like excited. I feel like even if it is like an online community, but you feel like excited and happy when you find other people online. And I started like um, as i said after feeling this this uh belonging and and support of that platform i decided to start sharing my launch so i i never forget the day that i i just provided an answer it got accepted and i was very happy it's like uh it was like the edge of the glory for me so i admit in the beginning i was hesitating and maybe it didn't I wasn't providing uh, high quality answers because I, I was like learning how to share. But little by little, uh, like small steps, I, I was improving them and I started to get ranked. And guess what? I, 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 I was like catching the eyes of many headhunters. So um, it, it was uh, fantastic. So meanwhile, I discovered another community which is like the power bi community so um with its like community uh, driven approach i accelerated my my learning so it was ensuring that i stay updated because i work a lot with uh, power bi and uh, it was like guarantee for me to stay let's say abreast of the latest trends and techniques used in with this tool so um, and of course, another challenge I had since I was working with confidential data, um, it didn't help me build at least a portfolio. So I started showcasing my contributions on different platforms, starting with the Stack Overflow and of course Power BI community. So 
and guess what? I started looking, um, I started building my brand, my personal brand on LinkedIn. So uh, step by step and s- and honestly, I started cutting off even with the, with the sending my CV uh, to the recruiters. I just dropped only the the, the, the LinkedIn uh, my LinkedIn profile, and I invite them to try to understand my profile through my contributions. So uh, until last year, uh, I joined uh, uh, the, the Microsoft Community Champion programs for Azure since um, my profile I'm just preparing I was like three years ago preparing to be a full stack and it was a decision since the beginning so I I will take also in charge the data engineering part so uh, by joining this um, it's like a community of uh, 200 like members who range from Microsoft full-time employees, MDA bound, uh, MVPs also, and suppliers and even external um, like uh, experts. We are here just trying to help all the customers. Um, of course, we are volunteering and we it's, it's like win-win situation and we will understand me in the next uh, maybe a few uh, slides. So, the free mentor uh, mentorship sessions. It played like they played a pivotal, uh, um, let's say, role in transforming my journey. Why? Because uh, I gained access to, um, let's say, invaluable insights and practical uh, uh, advice. Just I opened my calendar to everyone. And I started with the, um, with my former university, so I invited uh, students to who have like um, final projects in business intelligence, and I was like, I offer you 30 minutes to understand the subject you're working on, and to see if you have any challenge, uh, technical or something related to modeling, maybe. Uh, so the one the the one on one or one to one interaction and then fostered like I say deep understanding of data analysts. I also visualization that like strategic um, decision making. So uh, I the problem solving also because sometimes uh, people they come with problems that I didn't uh, see before. And I was like, um, I received a lot, not only students, even other um, professionals seeking for advice for uh, from all over the world. That's, that's the, the fun about it, so, uh, the, the funny parts. So I started having friends online, never met, but uh, uh, just uh, some of them, they even um, gave me like, for example, uh, as, as uh, uh, to recognize my effort with them, they started like um, s- some gifts, um, something like uh, uh, just um, valuable, but uh, it's like thank you uh, to thank me for the effort I was because I was mentoring like many people uh, for three, four, five months, six months, all of them, their free sessions. And uh, of course, um, as I told you, the win-win situation is like I, I I managed to. It's not like I'm sorry for the words. Like it's too dumb to 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 think that I'm not winning. No, and it's too dumb to think only about money. It's not like the case. Uh, in my case, it's like three pillar. Uh, first is access to the diverse expertise. Uh, since uh, this um, method helped me to provide like a rich uh, tapestry of expertise from various uh, uh, sectors uh, within business intelligence. So uh, I engaged with mentors because I was mentoring and, and I had mentees and I also had the chance to uh, get like mentors to help me and community experts. So I was exposed to a multitude of BI tools and practices, 
uh, resources that go beyond, le let's say, uh, like conventional tra training. So this diversity somehow allowed me to learn not just um, the technical skills, but also the strategic uh, application of VI in different business contexts. So I was like, um, let's say, it was especially enlightening uh, to see how BI principles are adapted in different uh, or various in industries. Because uh, to be honest, uh, maybe in the co like the common sense, we say you will be working three, four, five maximum con like uh, businesses um, in your career. So sometimes you can just continue or get specialized in one uh, business uh, context. So in my case, I had to get like an idea or the taste of each, uh, of each one. The second, uh, second thing is like the real time uh, problem solving and support. Um, so uh, I have like kind of the, um, I want to talk about the immediacy of assistance so um through online communities and mentorship so it's it's a little bit game changer so whenever i encountered with the privileges for example i gain uh within the communities i whenever i encounter like a roadblock it's like whether um uh, whether it was like tricky data uh, set or let's say a complex analytical model i could rely on the community, let's say highly ranked profiles to uh, help me. So to overcome uh, overcome at least like technical challenges uh, quickly. So third thing is networking and collaborative opportunities. I, I, I managed like uh, uh, my, my network expanded, uh, connecting with many professionals and uh, uh, thought like leaders in the BI space. So these connections uh, led to even collaborative projects where I could, let's say, um, uh, apply my learning, what I've learned in practical settings and gain feedback. Uh, so this is it. This is, this is the win-win the situation. So uh, for this year, my achievements so far, uh, I got like, um, from Stack Overflow, I got a connection uh, who helped me. Uh, then he checked like my profile and my contribution on Stack Overflow. Then he recommended me for the um, MSSQL tips and I got accepted to work with them as a technical writer. Uh, two years in a row uh, as a super user, a Power BI super user. Uh, last three months, uh, I got like, um, I was like the top uh, uh, um, community contributor. Uh, so if you are among like the top 10, you get like uh, uh, credit cards, <laughs> uh, virtual credit cards with like small amount to, to buy, for example, certification, vouchers, etc. And of course, I managed to facilitate more than 200 hours uh, uh, for final projects in business intelligence and also more than 10 events between conferences, workshops in BI uh, for different tools. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Amira. It was quite motivating. Uh, currently, we do have one question. Yes. So, in terms, so what we wanted to know was, uh, how, what tips uh, would you give for people looking to move into more of a data uh, analyst or business? Well, Data business intelligence. Um, so first, I thought I thought I was sharing my my screen. I don't know if you saw the presentation. Uh, we're not currently sharing. You are not sharing your screen. We apologize. Oh my god, 
I, I had an issue. I thought it was a sh um okay. Things you happen. Could... Things happen. <laughs> no, my okay. browser is is I don't know. It's a bug or whatever. I'm sorry. I can send it later. No uh, problem. We'll share it okay. with the uh, so, the question, can you please... Um, uh, so, could you provide a bit of insight uh, into somebody who would like to move into the business intelligence field? Like, what would you recommend for them to look into? To start their journey? I, I, al I always, I always... Um, uh, there is like French proverb. Uh, it's, it's not... Um, it's not too late for that. Uh, maybe it, it was. If we were like 50 years ago, back, it was like a little bit challenging because we didn't have that access to the information. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, with all the opportunities that we have within many communities, go to the communities, ask the questions. You will find people to advise you. Uh, people who are here just to, to share the, 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 the to share the, their um, experience uh, to help you to guide you. Uh, the frustration is always here. The first steps are a little bit um, um, are a little bit like uh, I understand. The first steps are a little bit difficult. That's normal. You're not the only person in the world facing that. But I, I, I was like that, and I. I couldn't learn by myself. I just needed to to feel um, at least uh, to, to have like the, an idea. So if I want to ask, for example, on this tool, I would least thing I can do is to check the official website. And, you know, almost all the vendors today, they understood that offering uh, uh, like linking a community to uh, to a tool or technology is is important. It's it's uh, it, it will help because you don't need only to wait to request, for example, uh, the help from that vendor and wait. And no, they needed to approach or make the dense distance less uh, between them and their customers. So today. Um, it's a win-win situation because if I'm going to help uh, share my knowledge, I'm helping people, they get the help. And of course, I will be uh, recognized for what I'm doing or the recognition will. How? If I'm going, especially in the data field, if I'm going to say, I work in this, but some recruits, like um, they request what, what you have done so far since working with data can be a little bit, uh, tricky. You cannot, like, for example, share uh, reports um, based on confidential data. You will say, I I'm, I'm, for example, I'm I'm a super user in this, um, or, or for example, I'm highly ranked. This is my contribution, at least for the last three months. These are the challenges I had, and this is how you. Uh, and I always say it, stop chasing recruiters. Even the recruiters, they, they change the, the way that they are hunting like people. So if you come here, what you the, the market is getting like, let's say day after day is getting more difficult. What can you do so far? What does recognize you? What does like differentiate you from other people? What makes you unique? Like the question. You know, I've been asking myself in many interviews and I get disappointed before. Why should we accept you? So, at first I was a little bit uncomfortable. And oh, as we say, as we always know that I can prepare the, the answer in advance. But, and I asked myself that question. Why should I first accept this opportunity? What I'm going to learn? Uh, what I can show you? really and i always w found myself uncomfortable with the way the technical interviews that they ask me about the definition and i answer no i always ask them to do you have a real uh, use case can we um, discuss what if today i'm going to fulfill this position what was the challenges maybe it's a new position maybe it's like the position of someone who left you know, so um, 
I always ask myself. I understand that with the age, we, we get at least, we get more and more the, the wisdom that we needed when we were uh, younger. But sometimes the questions, we, don't, we need to ask ourselves these kind of, like, these kind of questions. So today, if I say I work with Power BI, for example, or I work with this, this technology, what's making me really say? Is it like I open and just uh, uh, read and even for the certification, uh, I, I always tell people, OK, you got certified. That's, that's cool. Try to share the challenges you had. You're going to win. It's like the butterfly effect. You will get that promotion one day, don't worry. You will find that um, the, the position with a good salary. But it's not, it's not like very, it's not easy. The, the path is difficult. You need to learn and find your, like, your model, your learning model. For me, the best model I had or I experienced so far is integrating the communities and uh, sharing like my knowledge even with the sessions of the, the mentorship like sessions sometimes i get questions that i don't know subjects or things i don't know about so i need to just go and find the the the, the information so it's it's a win-win situation if you don't find yourself like comfortable in reading or uh, with the traditional ways of learning maybe um, joining an online community would be uh, uh, something that you need at least to cut off with uh, to cut with the, with traditional ways and you will be you will start let's say um, nothing goes for nothing you know it's like uh, um, you will start building your network you will people will know you for what you're doing what you're showing what you're writing uh, they will leave you feedback and this is how you can uh, uh, understand if uh, if 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 today you, you need because it's not only only for technical um, technical skills that needs to be improved there are other Skills. I, I discovered that, for example, even for um, to explain something to someone is not that easy. <laughs> you know, imagine that m many people are going to read your answers. So you need. That's why in the first, in the very beginning, I was a little bit. Um, no. Uh, uh, exactly. I was like hesitating. I was afraid, <laughs> and I got down votes. And you know, for example, with the platform mm -hmm. like Stack Overflow, it's like. They are a little bit strict, and I got upset, and, and then I understood. I understood that I need to be Grow as a explicit. Person. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I know that feeling all too well. And I'm quite shy in front of people, so you know I have that struggle. It's, I struggle, you know, conveying. I, what I, I'm trying to say I, with I people. met many people. I met many people. They are highly ranked in many platforms. They are shy in real life. In real life, they they. The, the, the one of them he 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 said it. He admitted it to me. He said, "I found myself comfortable helping people online because he had like that track. And it's like he he get nervous. He he tried to work on that many times, but like sometimes uh, sometimes you it's know, just you a bit too best. difficult. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, thank you for the invitation." Thank you, Mr. Uh, Wonderful having you here. You can, you... you can just. Yeah, this is my name. You can find me on LinkedIn, and sure. uh, I will be glad if you come with a question and uh, to see you all. You will find my contribution contributions in every uh, in my bio like section uh, in all the platforms. If possible, could you share uh, your slides so we can uh, share them with everyone? Of course. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, if you want, you can email it to us. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. All right. All right. Thank you, Amira, for that wonderful presentation. Moving on to our closing ceremony, I'd like to firstly thank everyone for attending today. 
as we celebrate this culmination of this event, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's made this conference possible. I'd like to thank our speakers who took out their time to attend and present, such as Dr. Ayub Shabat, Mr. Rory Pretty, Mr. Alan Peed, Mr. Swarup K. Bagul, Ms. Nas Nafisa Ali Bedi, Mr. Progress Charlie, Ms. Shamain S. Dube, Mr. Somanizi Diko, Mr. Nazir Juman, and our previous speaker, Ms. Samira Bedi Hafi. Secondly, I would like to express gratitude to the Duty Art Factory for organizing and allowing us to host this incredible conference. It has been our third year hosting it. I would list all the interns that help us, but unfortunately the list is quite long and due to time constraints, I will keep it short to the key members, such as Nikhil Ramdev, Mr. Tobani Ndedla, Mr. Mbuso and Mr. Niswa, as well as Nakulunga, and lastly, our director, Mr. Kasim Vanko. Thank you all of you for the active participation and engagement throughout the event. I'm confident that the knowledge and skills and connections we have gained here will serve as a solid foundation for future of our industry. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys. It was an honor serving you.